The meeting is now being recorded. Great, thank you, Madam Secretary. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our January uh, Board of Trustees meeting for the State Bar. Strategic planning in the works. Uh, we will call the roll, please, to start our open session this morning and convene very quickly into a closed session. Madam Secretary. Uh, Broughton. Here. Chen. Here. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. Here. Delenn. Here. Duran. Here. Ganong. Seleg. Shelby. Present. Sol. Present. <clears throat> Stallings. Here. Tony. Present. You have a quorum chair. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, this is a call for public comment on the closed session. Is there anybody in the public who would wish to address the board before we convene into closed session? See, we have six attendees. Looks like no one is indicating an interest to speak to the board. So we will uh, go into closed session. We anticipate coming back into open session right around 11 o'clock this morning. So we will see folks then. Thank you very much. Are we getting another a new link, Louisa, or using the closed session link from yesterday? If you if you have access to that, you can um, use the same link, but I have an email prepared that I'll be sending out right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you everyone. We are now recording. Great, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, we are back from closed session. Uh, I will note for the record that there is nothing reportable um, from that closed session. I wanna again offer my, my thanks for everyone's uh, patience in um, us getting started here with the open session. The plan for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is um, to, to finish one little piece of business uh, on the strategic planning, we will take a 30-minute uh, lunch break and then come back um, to finish up the strategic planning and the rest of the day. Uh, I do want to thank the trustees for their attendance and, um, and very valuable input this morning on the closed session um, and all of you for, for being here. So with that, uh, we are going to move on. Ms. Pai, I'm assuming that I can just go ahead and start with uh, what this 15 minutes is going to be. I think the only thing I'd like to do is maybe two things, Mr. Chairman. One is I heard you say 30 minutes for lunch break. I just want to confirm that because our note said 45, but I want to confirm that we're bumping that down to 30. So that's the first thing. I'm uh, adjusting the agenda accordingly. I want you to know that we will um, have a couple of stretch breaks to give people a chance to check email and, and to get up and walk around across the afternoon. And then the second thing I wanted to do is just um, have everyone just kind of take themselves back or recall um, uh, Ms. Wilson's report out yesterday. And, um, you know, I know many of you were taking notes. And so part of what was supposed to happen, have we not run out of time, is after sort of collecting that, that uh, feedback from, from Leah on goals and, um, and progress, we then wanted to take this mo this 15 minutes or so and have you, Mr. Chairman, talk about the vision going forward and, and how you want us to approach this conversation this afternoon. So with that, I will turn Perfect. it back to you. Great, thank you very much. And that's exactly what I was what I was thinking. So just to refresh everyone's recollection, Leah went through a very comprehensive 
look at our last strategic plan, um, reviewed you know, what was done, uh, the successes as well as the challenges and difficulties and where we may, may have fallen a little bit short on those goals. Um, and so the thought here is to get uh, the trustees reactions to Leah's uh, presentation generally. Um, if there are specific questions you wanna ask her by way of follow-up from that presentation, this is the opportunity. Again, with the thought that the rest of the day is to uh, develop our next five-year plan, which of course has to be informed by where we sit uh, now in light of our, uh, our goals from five years ago. So uh, with that, I will open it up to the trustees. Um, any questions or comments um, from Leah's presentation yesterday on, on uh, the strategic plan just ended, just ending. I um, didn't get an opportunity to share this. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't get an opportunity to share this um, with the general public yesterday, but um, I did share it when we met privately. And so I wanted to be able to share this more broadly. But um, I am just, you know, after being here for over a little over a year, I'm absolutely blown away by all that this organization does. And um, just want to say thank you to Miss Wilson and the entire State Bar organization, because distilling that into a conversation, that 34 page presentation, it was just impressive. Um, and I think oftentimes we get so saddled with what we're not doing right um, and with the challenges that we're hearing that we don't get an opportunity to really reflect on all this organization has done. And so for me, it was, it crystallized why um, I feel so honored to be around this dais serving with all of you. And just wanna say to the State Bar staff, um, thank you for all that you do, because so many of you have been with the State Bar for such a significant amount of time, and it is very clear that you are committed professionals. Wonderful to have Ms. Wilson back in the role of Executive Director. Recognize that we have challenges and opportunities moving forward, but um, would be remiss if I didn't take that opportunity, this opportunity as a board member, to just merely say thank you. And then I'll also close my comments um, and, and thank you to Mr. Stallings and Mr. Duran for your leadership. Thank you to Mr. Saleh for his past leadership, which is the leadership that I came under. And uh, to my colleagues on the board, I, I think we have some exciting times ahead. I think excitement also means that there are some laboring in the fields, but um, what an incredible opportunity that we have to serve the public. And then last but certainly not least, and I don't know how you do this, Ms. Wilson, but how you take that 34 pages and turn it into something. I think there's a road show that needs to go with what you presented to us. And so I certainly look to you and your leadership and, the, and your team's leadership in terms of making that happen. And I also wanna recognize Donna because Donna was, was leading the helm when I first came here, but it, it's, it's mind blowing to see what this organization has done and it's new iteration and form because you used to be something very different prior to 2018. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Trustee Shelby. Floor is open. Uh, I will jump in to just echo a little bit of what Trustee Shelby said. Um, although I, you know, I've, I've already gotten a taste of how much the organization does having, having been here for a couple of years more than she, but it is uh, never, uh, it is, it never ceases to amaze me truly the, 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 the amount of work that happens behind the scenes in serving um, our 200, and 200 plus thousand licensees and, and the public that they uh, are meant to serve as well. Um, what struck me uh, particularly about Leah's presentation is uh, again, the scope and the breadth of what the bar has done over the, the past five years in its first iteration um, as a de-unified, uh, as purely a regulatory agency. Um, th there's a lot of success there, um, but I think that Ms. Wilson was very honest with us and, and with the public and where the challenges still lie, uh, where, where we have room to improve. And I think that is again, the tenor of the conversation that I want, uh, I want us to engage in moving forward with the rest of the day. And that is, how do we move forward? How do we improve um, with maybe even some new, you know, some new insight 
and, and some new goals. And so that, I leave that to the, to the, to the group here um, so that we can develop those uh, together with the assistance, of course, of Ms. Pai and, and Ms. Wilson and, and the many, many fine people who support them. Ms. Dolan. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I really echo what um, Trustee Shelby and, and what you have said about the presentation. I'm so glad that we do really have, for me, a guidance uh, on, on how we're gonna go through, the, through our planning. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I also would like to acknowledge uh, Ms. Pai and in, in getting us through this and working with us. But um, this has been very helpful. It's been very, the, the presentation has been very helpful, uh, succinct and, and something that uh, will really make it even clearer for us to go through the planning. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dillon. Looking around the screen, don't see any raised hands, but any questions? One, one question from me um, for either all of you or just a few of you. Um, the thing that I appreciated most about um, the presentation that Leah shared with, with the trustees yesterday is she, in addition to talking about um, the status on goals from the five-year uh, plan, there are also some challenges and opportunities that she teed up in each of the areas of the board's mission. Is there anything that stood out to anyone that we want to be sure we take into the conversation this afternoon? I certainly made some notes. I saw others of you making notes. Um, certainly there was a lot of discussion around, um, you know, communicating out, um, you know, some, some communicating out some of what was discussed, but I also heard um, a teeny bit around um, resource, and I heard a teeny bit around um, more support for lawyers, put consumers first, need to engage consumers, just anything on the challenges slides that anyone heard that we just want to be sure we take into this afternoon's conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Pyman. Trustee Chen. So, uh, on the topic of support for attorneys, and I think Leah also touched on this yesterday, um, I very much want to continue past conversations we've had at board meetings and at strategic planning sessions to talk about uh, what's been referred to as proactive regulation, but what I actually view as proactive support for attorneys. Um, so we're not just, the state bar isn't just coming in at the discipline stage to say you did that wrong, but to provide support to say, here's how to get it right. And here are resources to help you do that. Here's a checklist that you can use in this situation. Or if you're confronted with this, here's a decision tree that might help you understand things in a clear way. Um, I think that would go a long way towards protecting the public, but also just supporting attorneys. And so I think that was a really important challenge that, that Leah brought out yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Chen. What, a, what an excellent point to reinforce. Trustee Tony. You're on mute, sir. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that I think would be useful is when we think about protecting the public, when we think about serving the uh, legal needs of, of uh, California consumers, um, which I think is you know a core part of our mission, um, what we ought to do is try to parse that down a little bit because not all consumers are treated, are, are created equal, if you will. Um, I think there are a lot of attorneys that, so in other words, I think that organizational customers, I'm talking about corporations, I'm talking about nonprofit organizations like, my, like, like the one I run, okay? We're very well served by the legal system, okay? And we're very well served because we put it in our annual budget. Okay, and, and I, I'm willing to bet that a large number of the 200,000 that we talk about approximately are engaged in representing organizations or corporations. Um, I, 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 I would like us to look at who is serving the rest of the 40 million individuals in California, and I bet it's a lot less than two, the 200,000, and I'd like us in this strategic planning to focus 
to really have a focus on who is being underserved. And I think part of that is not using the number. There are 200,000 um, attorneys who are uh, available for 40 million California residents. I, I think it's not quite accurate. And I think it, getting more accurate will help us understand how to do a better job. Thank you, Trustee Tony. At a certain point, I think that um, we'll look to Ms. Wilson to remind us of what the attorney annual attorney census tells us about how many lawyers work in, in law firms at various sizes. Um, and I think it, we can extrapolate how many lawyers then are, are solo practitioners or in small law firms, but maybe you don't have to extrapolate. Maybe we actually have those numbers. We, we do, but um, we also have um, economic census data that helps us understand at a macro level within our state, the dollar spend on the corporate legal market uh, versus the individual consumer market. And that is something that we've highlighted in some of our work around um, creating the paraprofessional program, for example, that you see this real disproportionality in legal spend. Um, but this is an area I think that's really important for us to stay on top of is sort of that macroeconomic trend uh, because things really are changing in the, in the legal market. Excellent point, thank you. Trustee Stallings. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to uh, build off of what uh, Trustee Tony just talked about, one of the things that um, I've discussed kind of more on an internal level is uh, issues that are uh, specific to rural areas and frontier, frontier areas in California and ways that we as a state bar can meet the legislative mandate uh, as set forth in Business and Professions Code 6001.1. And in 2018, the legislature made it clear that protection of the public, which includes support for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system, shall be the highest priority of the bar. And uh, Ms. Wilson, in her report, page 30 of her report, the challenges and opportunities regarding access, uh, access to uh, the legal system, set forth the challenge of lack of support for regulatory reform as a means of increasing access. So I think th ways that we can explore uh, supporting access to uh, the legal system uh, that maybe don't involve regulatory reform, but other things that, um, that we may have at our disposal. So I'd really like to have a more in-depth conversation about what that looks like. Thank you, Trustee Stallings. Trustee Broughton. Thank you. It's, it's interesting to me that both Brandon and I raised our hands after the comments of um, Mr. Tony relative to um, the access to justice issue. And I, that's one of the things I think Brandon and I can bring to the, to the table is because I am in the Central Valley, I generally am connected, if you will, or practice from Kern County down in Bakersfield all the way up to Stanislaus County. And and all of the um, areas in between. Mm -hmm. Several of the poorest counties in this state are in our area of jurisdiction. And I have, um, over the period of five years, frequently jumped in on that issue. Um, and I think it can bring a great perspective on that. It's a shame to me that we're dealing with that um, right now. Um, but it was one of the things that during, and, and I was reminded of this, it was one of the issues that early on when we went to, to define this organization, um, we had to decide whether we're gonna deal with it or not. Um, there are so many people that have no access to this judicial uh, system at all. And I think we really need to figure out what we're gonna do. I looked at the mission statement again, and it says, support the efforts of greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. I don't really know what that means and how as a practical matter. And I think hopefully we can get into this um, in our uh, uh, planning sessions here later on today and really figure out what it is that we as a bar association can do. Thank you, Trustee Broughton. On that note, um, I think we should take the next 30 minutes to, you know, to sort of prepare for that piece of the conversation. We are the 13 people who get to fill in the blanks, I think, Trustee Broughton on what that phrase in our mission statement means, among other things. So unless there's anyone else who wants to offer uh, something for the good of the order, let me take a look around. 
don't see anybody. Let's look at that right at noon. Let's uh, reconvene at 1230. Enjoy your lunch, everyone. Recording right now. And we're recording. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. We are reconvened after a very quick lunch. Thank you all for uh, coming back. I hope you got refreshed a little bit. And uh, we're going to just jump right into it. I'm going to hand uh, hand the mic, as it were, over to Ms. Pai to uh, lead us in the next portion. Okay, so let me just do a couple of quick reminders. Um, we will definitely uh, take a couple of breaks this afternoon and give folks time to just stretch, check email, and grab an extra coffee if they need it or water. Um, this next segment, which will probably take about 30 minutes to go through, um, just sort of goes to outcomes. And I, I do want you as we approach today to think about, um, again, as we said yesterday, this is not about having a proposal uh, written and um, tied up in a, put in a box and tied up with a red ribbon. But this is more about making sure that we incorporate as much of your good thinking as we can. Um, but this next piece is a little bit about outcomes, at least um, I think it'll help guide our discussion. We're gonna talk for a bit uh, about our primary audiences and who, who is gonna benefit from our success. And if we are successful, with this next five-year plan, who's who are the who are the beneficiaries? Just want you all to start think, to think about that. And then the only place we're going to get a little bit tactical is on the piece that that Mr. Taylor is going to lead for us, and that's just around what we think this work product ought to look like. Several of you said yesterday that it was really important that this take a high level. Uh, we take a high level approach to strategic planning. There have been some great tactics that have been discussed that we're all recording that will make their way into um, what, what we're gonna call at least for now buckets. But again, we wanna keep this at a high level, but think for a second or two about what we think this work product ought to look like. Then we will, that should take about 20 or 30 minutes. And then we're really gonna go into what I like to call this part, where we're really squishing around and talking about a lot of what we heard, what we think, what we feel, this is not scientific. Um, we, we recognize that we, this is a public setting, but we want folks to be um, you know, comfortable just kind of you know, pushing and, and pulling a little bit. Um, it's that great creative tension that gets us to the other end of, of the spectrum and gets this work product done. So that's what the, the great bulk of the afternoon is going to be spent doing. Along that line, um, we will probably come up with some issues that we'll just put on the parking lot. Um, Travis is kind of tracking those things for me. There may be some immediate to-dos um, that go onto our list. There will be some big ideas and some big issues. We will start to try to put those things in front just to, um, so that's what we want to try to accomplish. And then we'll come back and talk a teeny bit about resource. We'll talk a little bit again about um, audiences and stakeholders. We'll come up with some action items and next steps, and then we will do a wrap up. So quite a bit to cover, and I'm really grateful for uh, the participation. So any questions, concerns? Just wanna be sure, Are everybody on the same page? Okay, great. So thing I wanna just have everybody share uh, your two cents on, and let's just take about 10 minutes if we can for this piece. Um, who are our primary audiences? Who benefits most from our success? As you all think about this five-year plan going forward, simply put, who's it for? And I'll start with you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think it has to be for the public, right? We are here to protect the public. I'm not so sure that that's the first thing I would have said when you asked who the audience was, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is uh, our licensees are our biggest and primary audience. Um, but who, you know, who the benefit is, is for the public. Okay. Other comments? Mr. Broughton? Sorry about that. I, I agree. I might um, make it more specific. It's the public that use legal services. Okay. That's a good build. 
I'll just say there, Ms. Pai, if I could, that um, that that in and of itself uh, could be expanded and probably should be expanded from from the work that we've you know been looking at. Okay. Other feedback, and I, I want to call out the fact that I heard you. Um, our audience may be licensees, but but the beneficiaries may look like like someone different. So let's keep that conversation going, Mr. De La Cruz, please. Yeah, I agree with both uh, the public. I'm a public servant, so. But I also, in, in terms of attorneys, um, diversifying the workforce, right? Uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that we diver diversify uh, the attorney pool that we have to represent the public. So I think those two would be uh, top of mind for me. So let me be sure I'm clear. Potential audiences for you are potential attorneys? Fu yes. Future attorneys, if you will? Exactly. Okay. okay. Mr. Stallings. So just to build on what uh, Ruben and Mark said, um, I think our audience is not only the public that we serve, and then on a finer point, the uh, people who consume legal services, but uh, those who need legal services and don't have access to them. Okay. I think that's absolutely one way we protect the public. Thank you. Ms. Dalen? Uh, just to expand, um, those who do not have access, but also those who cannot afford to, to this access to legal justice. Okay. And Ms. Wilson? Well, I think the audience has to include our sort of key legislative stakeholders in particular. Um, or Supreme Court stakeholders, because it is a very affirmative and public signaling of our priorities and what we intend to do. And then another important audience is staff and prospective staff, uh, because it's a reflection of the culture and the values of the organization um, that informs the staff we have, but also the staff that we want to that we want to have. Okay. Thank you. I like that. Anyone else, Mr. Soul? I guess all I would say in, in hearing this is, is that I guess we're part of that audience as well as board members, uh, because this is uh, the template that is going to uh, keep us on track, keep us focused, uh, keep us coordinated, um, and uh, is our roadmap uh, for, the, for the next few years. I like that. Thank you. Um, who haven't I heard from? Ms. Shelby. I think that I think all of the stakeholders have been identified that I would have shared. Okay. I, I, I might just, you know, I would say marginalized, disenfranchised, and underrepresented communities if we want to get a little more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but outside of that, I concur with what everyone said. Thank you. Can I put something on the table a little bit? One of the mayors with whom I work uh, often refers to the city's partners in getting the city's mission done, right? Um, and it's, to me, it's, a, it's a, almost a little bit of a variation on the stakeholder role. Um, and when Ms. Wilson was talking about the legislative, uh, the, the, our legislative stakeholders, uh, the court, our, our staff, our employees, to me, I, I also see that we, we uh, should be, wanna be uh, in partnership with those people in moving uh, our mission forward. Um, that we developed through the strategy. Okay. And Mr. Tony, I've not heard from you, sir. Uh, d d d when you say audience, are you later gonna ask us about stakeholders and partners? I'm only asking to, to, to know how I should be responding to this. Um, or should I put I, it all in now? I, I, let's, let's talk about everybody. So who's, oh. who's on your list? Okay, so um, I, I really think this concept of partnership is really important, partnership with stakeholders. Um, and so 
I think we need, you know, that, that it's important for the state bar to have a partnership with the legislature. Um, I, I, I think that they are an incredibly important stakeholder, and I think we should treat them as, as partners, that that's important. I also think that's true for the state auditor, okay? Um, the state auditor is a huge stakeholder in um, a, accountability um, for the state bar. And we should also be looking at them and embracing them as a partner. And this, th this one may sound a little harsh, but I gotta tell you that, you know, part of the, what I think about is, you, you, you know, uh, accountability is kind of like, um, uh, there are a lot of levels of accountability that the state bar is accountable. In a lot of ways we are held accountable. And sometimes it's easy to think about the bodies that hold us accountable as adversaries instead of partners. So um, I'd say another um, audience is the media, okay? It's the media's job to hold the state bar and to hold any government agency accountable. That's their job. And I think we should embrace that, work to embrace that. And um, work to um, also uh, reach out and look for opportunities to um, let the media know about things that are happening that they may not know and to be more proactive. So that, that, that's how I think about this. I appreciate that. So, so while you're at it, because this was going to be the third part of the question for this segment, and that is, who are our existing allies? Mr. Cisneros, you're nodding. You got somebody in mind? Well, I was going to build on some of the previous statements about our partners. Um, I do think that state and government entities uh, play a big role and are a, huge, a big part of the audience uh, for uh, the strategic plan and for all the reasons that uh, Mark and others have just mentioned. Um, I think our partners are, are you know, kind of defined broadly uh, really cover a wide swath. And I think we wanna uh, uh, keep a lot of them in mind and our stakeholders, you know, similarly uh, fall in all sorts of categories. The people we serve, the people we report to, and the organizations that fund us, support us, and challenge us. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair? I think the law schools are an important component of many of our uh, many of our missions, right? And admissions, obviously, but also preparing uh, lawyers to be competent, ethical practitioners um, so that they don't end up in the regulatory and the disciplinary system so much. Are, are law schools our audience, beneficiary, or stakeholders slash partners? Yeah, I think I'd put them in two of those three buckets, the audience and the beneficiaries, potentially. I'd be interested to hear, I'd be interested to hear their, uh, the law school dean's uh, perspective on that, right? Whether they, they feel like beneficiaries of the work that the bar does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me do a quick recap and see if there's anybody to add. From, from an audience perspective, I've got licensees, future attorneys, key legislative stakeholders, key Supreme Court stakeholders, staff and prospective staff, trustees, uh, the, this, this body, um, August body itself, because this is gonna be a roadmap um, for your work these next five years, law schools. Beneficiaries also, who, is this, who are these goals for? Law schools again, but public who use the legal services, public in general, um, public members who are in need of legal services and don't have them or can't afford them, disenfranchised communities, and then under stakeholders slash partners, I've got the legislature and other state government entities, the state auditor and the media, which Mr. Tony suggests we ought to just own and embrace. Um, Ms. Dalen. Um, as partners, I think the working committees and, and the volunteers so that you know, we can work collaboratively. We're making sure that, that what we communicate is clear and what the policies that we're doing, that we're working collaboratively. It's a good point to remember because these are folks that you really wanna buy into 
your goals, right? As they're gonna have to be partners with helping you implement them. It's a very good point, thank you. Mr. Broughton? Yes, um, when I answered the question, I only heard who benefits from this. <clears throat> and, it's, and it seems to me that, uh, that the licensees themselves could also be beneficiaries because part of the mission statement is to advance the ethical and competent practice of law so that um, the licensees themselves could be direct beneficiaries. Um, I would also put in on the broader thing, perhaps our former sub entities, for example, the Access Commission and so forth, if they'll actually talk to us. Um, As beneficiaries? I'm sorry? As beneficiaries? No, the partners or audience as as sort of what we call here justice partners. Okay, we're talking partnerships now, and so I'm saying okay. you may want to reach out to those former ones, as well as the California Lawyer Association. Got it, Miss Chen. Please, I didn't hear it on the list. Um, Maybe I missed it and maybe it's already there, but the judiciary strikes me as a beneficiary of, you know, ethical, the ethical practice of law and the rules of professional responsibility and the enforcement of those rules. Got it. All right. So this is a comprehensive list. Um, I think it is going to help us think about goals with, I want it, want it to help us think about goals with that in mind. Let me go back to the other question I asked and then we'll, we'll go to the next se segment, Travis. Let's talk about current allies and potential allies. Anybody? Mr. Tony? You're on mute, sir. Thank you. Just listening to this conversation, it, 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 um, listening to Trustee De La Cruz talk about the importance of making sure that we focus on um, equity, inclusion, and diversity within the field of law practice. Um, and also um, someone bringing up uh, law schools. Uh, it, it makes me think that law schools may also have the potential of being a partner and ally because I'm, I'm willing to venture that law schools um, also want very much and have as a core mission to diversify and uh, uh, the, the legal profession field. And I think they spend a lot of time trying to recruit candidates to, to come in. And so that would be an area that I could imagine that we could reach out and um, have a conversation about how um, our efforts can complement each other. I like that, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, comprehensive list. If we were in person, we'd be able to reference this up on the board. If you wind up just kind of needing me to repeat it, I'm happy to do that through, through the rest of the conversation, but that's very helpful. Um, I'm gonna just move quickly then to just, again, just the one segment where we're gonna be a little bit tactical, but this is just to help us get a sense of where you all are relative to what the final work product might look like. And um, my, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Taylor is gonna pull up uh, a couple of samples for us to take a look at and, and maybe walk us through and get some feedback from all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you, everyone. Been following the discussion, and definitely uh, we've had some good discussion yesterday and today. So you're all familiar with your strategic plan, but we also wanted to show you some examples of other strategic plans. <coughs> We're going to quickly walk through three examples: uh, Calsters, Florida Bar, and also the Insurance Diversity Task Force. We'll talk a little bit about how the plans are structured and styled, what's similar, what's different. And we'd also like to get your feedback on them. And we're not focused on content at this point. It's really more about that structure and style. And there was discussion yesterday about the complexity of the bar and the challenge of communicating what you do with your audiences. So if I could plant a seed as we review these examples, it would be simplicity and clarity. Is it possible to be clear and concise without sacrificing substance? 
Uh, and it's important to note as we go through these plans, we're not looking to demonstrate what's right or wrong. Each strategic plan is unique and specific to that organization, but they can be helpful as we think about developing your uh, next strategic plan. And so the first one with the California State Teachers Retirement System, this plan is uh, geared for 2017, or I'm sorry, 2019 to 2022. It's 12 pages total. It's concise, high level direction uh, and measurement. It's rooted in its mission, vision and values. There's an introduction section uh, right in the beginning from the CEO, the now former CEO, that helps frame and add context to the strategic plan. It was formed, uh, informed by employee survey feedback, interviews, and facilitated conversations with leadership and obviously the teacher's retirement board. There's four focus areas. We see them right here in this mission of success page. Uh, each of the focus areas has its own goal, financial governance, digital transformation, member employer, members for them being California <coughs> educators, employers being school districts and organizational strength. And one thing that just came to my thought here, just to disclose, Calsters is another client of our firms. We did not work on this strategic plan, but that's the same. This vision of success, what they did is they were looking at targeting 2028 beyond the years of the strategic plan, thinking about the outcomes. What did they want to happen? As you see, they're very high level items um, to think about where do they want to get to and use that as a guide for the strategic planning process. They restate their mission, vision, and core values. They do a visualized strategy map with these four focus areas and how they relate to the vision and mission. And then here's really the, the you know, crux of the strategic plan. So what they did is they, um, they have one page per goal and then they have about four to five objectives per goal. And then they include one to four ways to measure and target each objective. So again, one page per goal, it's very high level and succinct, but you see the clarity in terms of the objectives that flow from the goal and then how they measure and target. And Calster is obviously a pension system concerned about return on investment, concerned about funding teacher retirements, measurement and long-term uh, planning is a very important part of their core functions. If you just see that it, the, the layout just slightly, but it's the same consistent style across these. Before I move on to the next one, any questions or comments regarding that plan? Mr. Durant? Uh, I, I just like this one visually. I like the use of the bullet points that are I mean, there are there are many bullet points in some of those um, some of those goals, uh, but they're 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 meaty enough to understand what this organization is interested in, what they care about, and what they are intending to work on. Uh, I, this I think this was one of my favorites actually. Yeah, it, we don't see a lot of measurement and targets in different strategic plans that we looked at. We try to show you these ones. The three that we're that we're looking at are all succinct. We think that's important given the complexity of the state bar and trying to simplify those things, but this one was, was, was interesting in its layout. Okay, and I can't see everybody, so if I can get some help from, from the team, if, if there's any comments. I'll let you know if there are any hands up. Thank you. So the next one is on the Florida bar. This strategic plan is 2019 to 2022 five pages total. There's no introduction or context. It's really just the facts. It's restating the mission right up top. We've got five objectives. And then the subsequent pages go through on each of these objectives. So you see like objective one, and then a list of action items. So they have one page per objective with four to seven action items per objective. What's and if we go through and you see this is the structure of 
of all the objectives, but I want to point out an objective five, which covers diversity and inclusion. They include this extra section to help clarify the Florida Bar Board of Governors view of the term diversity. It's the only objective that has an added description where you have some context that helps you see, look into their thinking. Now, what I what I don't know is it, it, there might be a companion document or something else that led into it, but we're really focused specifically on the strategic plan here. And so that was something I wanted to point out. Any questions or, or comments uh, on this document before I go on to the next one? Any thoughts on that one, Mr. Chair, since you weighed in on the first one? Okay. And again, you know, we're not fo focused on content or what's right or wrong, but just as you think about what you're looking for for the state bar, seeing these, these different components um, in addition to the, the plans that you've had before. This one's a little bit different. So this is the Insurance Diversity Task Force. They worked in coordination with the California Department of Insurance and Com Commissioner uh, Ricardo Lara, different stakeholders that came together to form this strategic plan. So we thought this would be an interesting one to show you. It's only focused on one year, right? It's 2020, 2020 to 2021, 10 pages total. There's an introduction from the, the director. Again, lays a little bit of context, helps kind of frame up the discussion, what went into it. Um, they had a number of discussions between the um, California Department of Insurance and the staff and the task force members, as well as various internal and external stakeholders. And that led them to the development of this plan. Similar to CalSTRS, they restate their vision, mission, mission and goals. And these are a vision, mission and goals that are specific to the task force. And then what they did is they focused on two high level areas. Uh, as you see at the top and the brown, it's advancing governing board diversity. That was one. And the second one is advancing supplier diversity. Those appear to be both pulled from their vision and their overarching task force goals. So they kind of took those two branches and then developed their strategic goals underneath those. And so for each of those high level areas, they broke it down into two to three categories with one to three goals for each category. And then each goal has one to three objectives. So there's more layering in this one where they, they looking at the governing board diversity and supplier diversity. And so you see these kind of top topics to generate awareness of the governing board diversity, to publicize achievements, to incentivize change among insurers, um, highlight the impact of diversity initiative and task force. So this one had three different categories and the other one has two. And then for each of these areas, then they have the goals underneath and key objectives. So it's a little bit harder to ascertain the, the flow from where it starts to where it ends, but they're covering a lot of ground. And, uh, and they're also looking to achieve consensus among a number of stakeholders to get there, but you still have a pretty overall uh, simple design, easy to see um, and, and, and go off of. Similar to the Florida bar, we don't see the measurement pieces or anything, but there could be a companion plan. I know for CalSTRS, they have an annual business plan that they that they track with staff to help ensure implementation of the larger strategic plan. So with that, I'll stop the share, but I'd like to get reactions. Is there anything that you that you see that you would like to incorporate into what we're doing for the, the state bar strategic plan? Anything that you, you don't want to incorporate or any other expectations or examples that you'd like to share? And try to answer that question with the conversation we just had in mind around our audiences, who's gonna benefit, who our stakeholders and partners are, you know, who, who's gonna look at this? Mr. Stalin. Mr. Stalin. You know, I, I don't know if there was any particular uh, document that I saw that did uh, too much for me, you know, compared to the document that we already have. 
but really what struck me just in the context of our last uh, discussion topic was the use of, or potentially the use of um, various sub, um, sub graphics to pop out. Um, so you could view the strategic plan either as a stakeholder, um, you know, our intended audience, um, you know, the person going in could choose how they want to view that, um, you know, what, what the intended audience was. And then for there to be measurable um, ideas or goals for them as the audience and how they could partner with the state bar and particular goals. And so um, I think there, there could be some cool, um, you know, graphic ways to get people to buy into this mission and to see how they can continue to partner with us on our strategic plan. So um, I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like an interactive strategic plan and you could filter based on, you know, who you are or what you're interested in looking at. I'm thinking about a Power BI based strategic plan. Yeah, and so, and that would, it could include links to, um, you know, if you're a member of the public and you wanna get involved in access to justice initiatives, there's the link right there. And so just be kind of like this massive clearinghouse for uh, ways to partner with the state bar and not just a place to stop, to, to you know, stop, uh, but a, a place of beginning to uh, really continue that buy-in. So visually have something that's compelling for um, for a wide swath of your audience is as, 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 as inclusive as possible have the simplicity so that it's easy for, for folks to consume and understand, but then you get the depth and engagement so that you could go deeper and, and, and perhaps lead to some sort of engagement. Does that capture that right? All right, thank you. Ms. Shelby. I was happy to see the insurance diversity initiative um, example because I was the first vice chair on that initiative once that bill was passed. And so they've come a very long way and then I served as chair as well. Um, you know, the, the four things that I wrote down were context, educate, clarity, and measurement. That, that's how I see and envision a strategic plan and then something that lives in an electronic and a physical environment because a large part of our constituency, um, when, when I think of the public who calls in um, and they, they've got a, a, a regulatory issue with representation, you know, how does this document live in a physical form that someone can touch and feel? And then how does this document live in an electronic form? But I, but I, I do think context in terms of what it is, what it's supposed to achieve, educate in terms of understanding, clarity in terms of being concise, because I don't think people read. And I, I, I say that respectfully as a public member. I know all of you attorneys have done a significant amount of reading and distilled through a lot of information. And then measurement, I would say within the context of measurement tracking as well, right? Because you want people to be able to track your performance. And I would also add accomplishments. I don't know accomplishments because, and maybe that's inside of context. Maybe that's inside of level setting, sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't see who's, who jumped up next, but uh, Mr. Duran. Actually, I think Mr. Tony had a sound raised before I did. Mr. Tony. Thank you. Um, you know, I was, um, it was useful for you to put those back up um, and for having included uh, those examples in the packet um, beforehand for us to review. So I do appreciate that. And, you know, part of what it made me wonder is whether there would be value in considering a strategic plan of a shorter duration than five years to kind of really kind of push the urgency. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I deal a lot in climate policy. And there are all these goals for 2035, 2045. It's real easy to get people to say yes on things that's so far in the future that you don't have to do anything right away, okay? And even a five-year plan, there's a sense of, well, we've got five years to get there. And I think there are a number of priorities and charges that the state bar has where there's an expectation that we get there sooner than five years. 
So that, that you know, part of it, and, and seeing the insurance one year plan, right? It was like, oh, a one year strategic. I've never seen anything like that. Oh, huh? Maybe you know, a two to three year strategic plan, and then we'll do it again. So, so that's part of what it made me think about. Um, I, I will say that a strategic <laughs> plan. Uh, I'm less interested in the format and more interested in what it needs to have. We need to, I think it helps to have a shared sense of vision and a shared sense of belief. You know, the vision of what kind of world do we want to build? What is it we want to see? What's our vision, our aspirations, our biggest aspirations of what the bar could do? And then believe, what do we believe? What do we believe should be the end state of what people deserve. Do we really believe um, that uh, having access to legal services is a right that everybody should have? Um, I, I don't think we do, and that's okay, okay? I, I, that, that may be a bridge too far, but whatever it is we believe, I, 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 I think a strategic plan is a home for that. And, and then as was brought up by Trustee Shelby, we need to have some measurable goals there. And if we end up with the five years because we think that's what the legislature mandates us to do, then we need to have interim goals on an annual basis that are part of the strategic plan so that we, um, it doesn't have the feeling of, well, we didn't get it to it this year. We, we, we got four more years, what's the rush? I, I, I wanna make sure that we, we feel and act upon a sense of urgency. Really helpful. And you, you, you got me excited with some of the things you're talking about because that, so we're gonna get into some of that discussion on the, on the substance. Mr. Duran? Um, Trustee Tony's discussion just reminded me of something I heard earlier with respect to near-term, mid-term and long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that uh, that's something that we should keep in mind as we're developing uh, the strategy writ large, but also the document we're talking about. With respect to the document, the formatting actually does, does make a difference to me because um, as Trustee Shelby pointed out, I, I think we know that most people just aren't gonna sit and read long, long text. It's just, as we were showing, as you were showing the, the samples on the screen, the reason why I liked uh, the Calisters one so much was because it, it was digestible um, and those bullet points were, were um, uh, what's the right word? You know, they, they were meaningful, they were, they were substantive. The tracking also was a very important piece for me, just visually, um, I found it a much more user-friendly document, but it actually had content that spoke to me, even though I'm not so familiar with what Calsters does. So those are my thoughts. Cassandra knows we had some like, you know, over 50 page examples that we decided not to include in your packet. Uh, Mr. Soul. I just want to associate myself with, uh, with all the, the comments that have made been made thus far. Uh, and in particular, I would like to zero in on what uh, Trustee Tony just mentioned about uh, a shorter duration of a, uh, of a strategic plan. It was a thought that also uh, came to mind for me. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's something that can help us in terms of uh, how the, the various audiences we just talked about uh, uh, perceive us uh, from an accountability standpoint and from an accessibility standpoint. Ms. Chen? I just wanted to second what uh, Chair Duran noted about the digestibility of the first example that you showed us. To have everything visualized on one page, um, I think for me and for various stakeholders, the public, the legislature, I think is hugely important to just understanding everything that is the state bar. Can we distill it down to that? I don't know, but I'd like us to try. Um, and then for each of those, high level goals, having it all on one page, I think also is just helps you get your arms around just what is, what are we trying to do? Ms. Wilson? Yeah, I was just gonna share that the, the, um, 
well, the statute does require 6140.12 here that we will implement a five-year strategic plan to be updated every two years. So I don't, I don't think we have flexibility around the duration of the plan, but in the, in the current version, you know, there are a lot of um, initiatives with their own individual timelines. And I think that's what you're, you're all referencing is they, they're, you know, there would be interim benchmarks um, of progress along the way. So I just wanted to, to say that I, I don't think at this juncture, we have flexibility around the five-year reach. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Tony? Um, I, I, I think that our executive director is correct. We don't have the authority on our own, okay, to um, uh, you know do a shorter duration than five years. However, it may be the case that in consultation with the legislature of what we're planning to do and asking for their advice and input, um, I could imagine that there's at least a possibility that um, the key stakeholders might um, be open. I don't know, <laughs> but, but I'm just saying that I think this is the kind of thing where uh, I, I'd like to feel that as part of the process. I mean, the good news is we're not making a decision today here, okay, on the strategic plan. But I, I, I think in terms of, you know, some of the directions we're going like, you know, ex exploring a shorter duration, I guess I would rather that we have that conversation and then take their input into it. They may come up with a solution that we didn't think about, or maybe they don't like it, but I, I'd rather know for sure rather than only point to a paper. Mr. Sowell? I guess all I'll say is this. I understand what the statute says. Um, when, is, when has the legislature ever turned its back or been upset with folks that, that do something sooner, faster, or better? And so maybe that's something just for us to keep in mind in terms of the timing component as we go into the next parts of the discussion because some of these items could be more of a longer term variety but maybe benchmarks on the way or you might see things that are really pressing with a sense of urgency and you wanna put that shorter timeline on it. So it just might be something good just to, to keep in mind as we go forward. And with that, I think I'm gonna pass things back over to Cassandra. Yeah, I think it's good discussion. I think it's helpful. I hear um, a lot of consensus. Uh, the word of the hour might be digestible, but I also heard compelling, inclusive, simplicity, um, promote engagement, context, educate, clarity, measurement, also include our accomplishments. Uh, from a format perspective, there ought to be both an electronic as well as a hard copy available um, so that we take into account all members of the public. Um, shared vision, shared belief, measurement, interim goals, maybe this notion of near Mid and long term, though, our executive director reminds us that we can add some timelines on key initiatives. So I think this is good feedback. Um, again, if you take that, this, and, 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 and then tie that into um, our discussion at the top of the hour around um, who this is going to benefit and who our audiences are and who our potential partners are. It's a great way to walk now into what's going to be the meat of the discussion for the afternoon. And, um, and that's the content. What's it going to say? So one of the things uh, we want to do is get some feedback from all of you on, you know, again, you've got a lot of information, both ahead of this conversation, as well as in some of the conversations we've had over the last couple of days. Before we talk through some of your feedback, we want our friend, there he is, we want our friend, Mr. McLeod to come on and just give us one more bit of, um, of feedback and then we'll go back, go into some of the discussion around um, content. So we're gonna talk, you are going to talk about 
the public. Thanks, Cassandra. <clears throat> so we were able to provide all of you with feedback that we've gotten from um, surveys that we've conducted of attorneys, um, discussions that we've had with State Bar staff, surveys that we also conducted um, with members, uh, the, the members of the sub-entities that uh, work on behalf of the State Bar. Um, what we weren't able to provide you with uh, in advance of the meeting was feedback from the public. And there's been a lot of discussion about um, the public. What is, who, you know, who are our public? What is the public that we are protecting? And, um, and what do they think? How do we get their input? And um, we conducted a, uh, a survey of sorts uh, using a crowdsourcing platform called Thought Exchange. And I'm going to show you the results of that. And I'm going to try and keep it brief because I think we're, uh, my sense is that we have a lot to cover. But um, what I'd like to share with you uh, in this PowerPoint real quickly is, is the findings from the work that we did uh, using this crowdsourcing tool, Thought Exchange. And um, as soon as I get better using my Zoom screen after load these many years of using Zoom. Um, let me run through real quickly with you what we found um, in soliciting feedback from the public about okay. the work of the State Bar. Um, Thought Exchange, it's, uh, as I mentioned, a crowdsourcing uh, application that allows uh, users to provide open-ended responses to questions. And then following the open-ended responses, when you ask people what they think about some topic, you then it then allows the users to rate each other's responses. So it's not just the solicitation of the input, but it's also then getting input from everybody who participated on um, the different ideas that are uh, generated through this platform. Um, we spent a week um, soliciting input from the public um, to get their thoughts on six core state bar functions. These are the same core functions that we solicited input on from our licensees and from members of sub-entities. And it's also the same buckets of sort of core functions that we have been working with in terms of, you know, these are the primary things that the State Bar does. Uh, promoting access to justice, we got 160 thoughts. Um, and as I mentioned, you get a thought from the participants and then the, the participants are asked, you get as many thoughts as the participants are willing to share. And then you get ratings of the different thoughts within that network. So on the question of promoting access to justice, we got 160 thoughts, 2,063 ratings. On admitting new attorneys to the profession, we got 123 thoughts, uh, a little over 1,700 ratings. On public protection in the discipline system, we got 60 thoughts, 347 ratings. And on promoting diversity and inclusion in law, we got 52 thoughts and 540 ratings. And then promoting the ethical and competent practice of law, 50 thoughts, 345 ratings, and then the final of these six big buckets of core functions, we got um, 36 thoughts and 267 ratings on the topic of investigating unauthorized practice of law. I'm going to show you what the top <clears throat> ranked thoughts were that we got in each of these areas, but I did want to just provide a quick overview of what I think are sort of like some, some meta findings outside of the specific thoughts that were provided to us. Um, the first and and easy to see issue is that the interest of the public varies significantly depending upon the topic. We got um, uh, the public had equal opportunity to weigh in on these topics. Um, there wasn't any one of these that was pushed out more than the other. Um, and yet we got 160 people responding to the issue or excuse me, 160 of these, these thoughts on the question of access along with the 2000 plus ratings of the question of access to justice compared to only 36 of these thoughts on the question of unauthorized practice of law. Big difference in terms of what engages the public when we um, ask them about the core work of the State Bar. Um, a second kind of meta finding here is that um, I, I think this also gets to some of the conversations that we've been having regarding our public and what it is that we're seeking to do for the public in terms of protecting them. I think that there's some fundamental misunderstanding about what the bar does. The law gets conflated with law enforcement, gets conflated with judges. And so some of the thoughts um, are interesting, uh, perhaps great public policy ideas, but not necessarily on point for what is within our scope of work. And so I think that that may point to a bit of a 
uh, uh, just one of these challenges with regard to our public in terms of like how do we to get into a dialogue with them and to get their input we really need to spend some time talking with them about what it is exactly that we do and and i think that this there are limitations to doing that um, within the scope of this particular um, tool that we were using to get the information and then the final thing that i'll note just that i i saw in the data was that in some cases you know soliciting information from the public it may not represent the public in the sense that people are self-selecting in when we push these out to the public. We were certainly not targeting attorneys. We were not targeting applicants to the bar. And yet the people who selected in to comment on these topics, in many cases, provided answers that indicated that they have specialized knowledge, which really is only going to be coming from somebody who, say, is an applicant to the bar. It's only going to be coming from licensee. So we saw a self-selection of participants that appears to have included many applicants to the bar and attorneys in the sample. So, so we have to be careful in terms of interpreting the content, the, the results of the, the survey, um, because in, in some cases it's 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 not the public as we were trying to conceptualize it or think about it, apart from our licensees or, or applicants to the bar. So with that said, let me go through quickly. We've got six topic areas, as I mentioned. And um, for each of those topic areas, um, what I'm going to show you is simply this is the prompt. And on this one, the prompt was for the question of the state bar discipline system and um, how we framed it in our prompt to the public. We said California state law requires the state bar to protect the public from attorneys who engage in this conduct. What do you think is the best way to protect the public from unethical attorneys? So we got, these are our three top rated comments that we got. And they had to do with integrating ethical norms into all of law school and apprenticeship study instead of the current system of standalone course and exam. Um, some additional commentary regarding law school classes and culture set out as a baseline for what's ethical, how to respond on ethical conduct. These two both point to imposing serious discipline. The, the sort of follow on may not be exactly correct, but the, I think that the, the lead comment on each of these, um, you'll see that the respondents are allowed to sort of say what their thought is and then talk a little bit about why they think that's important. And so these bold, uh, bolded text is what they said was their thought about the issue. And then the, the follow on non bold text is what was shared in terms of why they believe that that's important. But in both cases here, in indicating that there's a belief that there's a need to impose serious discipline for attorneys who engage in misconduct. And these were the number two and number three rated comments. Before I proceed to the other five topics, I just wanna pause because when you're in this um, share screen mode, you're, you're flying blind, and you don't have a chance to see if anybody has questions or comments. I'll let you know if I see any hands. Okay, thank you for that, Cassandra. Of course. So going back then to the presentation, the five remaining areas of um, core state bar operations that we asked about, um, the second prompt here is the State Bar of California investigates fraud to protect Californians from scams run by people posing as attorneys and selling services that are not legal and allowed to provide. So as you'll see, uh, just con communicating what unauthorized practice of law is, this is one of these things that we struggle with, I think, and you have to, it's a little bit wordy, but that's what we understand uh, non-attorney unauthorized practice of law to be. Um, so what do you think the state bar should do to protect California from this type of legal fraud? Um, our top ranked comments here had to do with sanctioning if it has jurisdiction and refer to appropriate agency to prosecute and hold these people accountable. That's good to see insofar as this is something that we have certainly um, attempted to do with NOCTC is to try to make sure that these cases are referred to district attorneys locally who do have the authority to sanction these cases, um, actively investigate and seek out the crimes and then prosecute, increase public awareness of how to avoid another area that we've um, spent a fair amount of time and energy working on is, is uh, reaching out to the communities that are most affected by unauthorized uh, practice of law. Um, and then educate the public about how to file complaints and increase capacity to investigate complaints. Um, the third prompt here has to do with our admissions work. Each year, the State Bar of California tests more than 10,000 applicants seeking to become licensed to practice law in California. What do you think the State Bar should do to ensure that newly licensed attorneys are both competent and ethical? So here, 
Um, it looks like it didn't really rise to the top. The thing that I mentioned earlier about having a lot of um, what appeared to be interested parties, more than the public, we had a lot of comments that came in, though it seemed uh, that specifically referenced the National Conference of Bar Examiners, that referenced the multi-state bar exam, things that I don't think the public is generally aware of. But our top rated comments here had to do with finding new ways to admit attorneys, uh, interview, work experience, testing on practice of choice. Um, here, um, admitting new attorneys under provisional license programs for practice that are in high demand um, suggests some knowledge of the fact that we are doing provisional licensure right now. Provisional license for new attorneys to dis assist the big public demand that can't pay for an attorney in certain cases. Um, and then please create a specific uh, subject specific bar exam where future attorneys specialize in the fields that they intend to practice. Um, under the question of increasing access to justice, and as I showed at the outset, this was the, um, this was the topic area that uh, garnered the most thoughts and uh, the highest number of ratings as well. State Bar of California mission includes increasing access to justice. What do you think is the best way to increase access to justice in California? Um, these are a bit thin. Um, uh, it's um, affordability. Um, having equal access to a lawyer. Um, and then this one is the only one that really begins to appear to get to something more like a policy solution or a recommendation with regard to policy uh, requirements for pro bono work. Hmm. On the question of diversity and inclusion, uh, this was the prompt, the mission of the State Bar of California includes working to increase the diversity of the legal profession. What do you think is the best way to increase the diversity of the legal profession in California? Um, law school affordability rose to the top here. Uh, make law school affordable without having to incur thousands, hundreds of thousands in student debt. Um, encouraging students to work hard. To judge someone by the content of their character, not the color of the skin, was the third top rated comment here on the promotion of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. Hey, Mr. McLeod, I want to um, I want to go back two questions, if you might, very quickly. I apologize. Yes, of course. Uh, I think your comment was um, of the three responses or of the three yeah, responses. One of them was more oh, this one right here. So the requirement for pro bono work that presents an opportunity for uh, the board to talk about policy sort of issues or take policy positions. I actually think that the first one also presents some opportunity for us there. Having lawyers shouldn't just be for the rich. Uh, uh, for some reason, that calls out to me from, I understand we, you know, we may not have <laughs> policy authority over uh, who can afford uh, or who can, you know, how much money folks are making in the state, but I think we can and should think about this issue. I think it's important. That, that's a good point. Um, it's, it seems maybe more of a value statement. I'm not sure, uh, you know, uh, Trustee Tony was mentioning earlier, you know, is, is there a right? Should, should one have a right to uh, legal representation or access to the legal system? And if effective access really means having a lawyer, then that does speak to this question. Okay, thanks. Um, this is the question of ethics. Um, I think one of the under, sometimes underappreciated and um, overlooked areas, even though it's pretty core to our, our work. Um, State Bar of California works to ensure that attorneys licensed in the state are both competent and ethical. Um, uh, what do you think the State Bar should do to ensure that attorneys practicing law in California are competent and ethical? Um, here, we um, came in for a little bit of abuse. Agencies who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Although, um, you know, a, an emphasis here on some things that I think have been discussed and that will probably be discussed more in terms of the formulation of our current plan, transparency and accountability um, are emphasized in this top ranked comment related to the promotion of ethical and competent practice of law. Um, hold the uh, attorneys, I may perhaps it hold it to a much higher standard than, yes, it hold attorneys to a much higher standard than average citizens do not dilute the bar qualification to make people feel better like everything else in California. Um, and here, the third top rated comment relates to a finding that the legal profession has a very serious problem with implicit bias. Um, the legal system purports to be a justice system. Having a pervasive issue with implicit bias leads to a great deal of legal injustice. 
So those are the six um, top areas. Uh, we have really, I, 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 I don't know if we scratched the surface and there's something much deeper down below this that we can dig into more. We've had the time to scratch the surface, whether there's more or not is, uh, remains to be seen. But this is uh, the results of what we uh, found from putting a survey out to the public um, and for about a week. Uh, and Dad, how the, many actual individuals responded? You know, that's a good question. I was looking through the numbers and the, the number of thoughts is not the same as the number of people. So, so people can provide multiple thoughts. I don't know the exact number. Um, I can get back to you with that, but it's, it's less than the total number of thoughts and much less than the total number of ratings. Can you give us a little feedback on what you saw and heard in these responses versus what we saw and heard in, in so many of the other responses we heard from stakeholders? You or Leah, but you, you've certainly called it out, which I think was important. Me? Are you going to do that, Doc? I think I asked you to look at how this aligns with the other. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think it does align that well. It's, it's. I, and I think that this gets to the, the challenge of separating out our, our public. Um, I think yes. in many cases it, it's. Yes. I mean, there's some values issues that align: accountability, transparency, access to justice. I think that those values align, but in terms of the specifics. It doesn't appear to align to me because I don't think that the public has the specific knowledge. I think that, you know, this issue of who the public is, I think oftentimes we have kind of a latent public that we're protecting. They're, they're not yet necessarily our public until they need an attorney, at yeah. which point they are our, our public. And so you need to probate your estate. You need to, you need to a family law attorney. You've got a dependency issue, whatever it might be. These, these are when the public kind of become our public for purposes of the work that we do. Yeah. Ms. Davis? I would just add, sorry, okay. that I think that the, there is alignment in terms of, and, and maybe this is Doug, what you're calling values, but <clears throat> the um, need to focus on how our agency is perceived and do we have legitimacy? Because I see that coming up in these comments um, that, the themes around access, <clears throat> I think, are very similar to what we heard. There's a lot of vast differences among our different constituencies as to how you increase access. But the idea that it is a, an issue and one that the state bar needs to address, I think, is pretty um, uh, consistent. So, I, you know, I, I maybe I think they're very in the weeds on admissions, but even there, um, looking at alternative pathways, that's something that does come up from other stakeholder groups as well. So I think maybe there, there, there's a bit more um, consistency, all, even though there's not a great deal of understanding by many folks about what the State Bar does. Or what your scope of work is. Ms. Dalen. Um. Thank you for that, Doug. Um, I think probably this is one way where we have to really get to know who our public or how we can reach out to our public and how to engage our real public. I don't know if, you know, doing qualification as far as not, not a lawyer or not a licensee to answer, but, um, but probably this is not just for this, but for future and how to engage our communities, uh, the, the different types of communities where we can, we would have them in the database and have them send it to their community, their own databases. I don't know if we have such a thing where we have, we have you know, the a nonprofit organization, on, uh, you know, immigrants or migrants and, and all those things that we can just really use them as our allies to be able to help us get to our programs and be able, not just for surveying, but for other programs and for relaying our you know, policies and communicating to them. I think this is one way also where we should really probably uh, put it uh, top of mind and how we can truly bring it down to uh, uh, the love, to our public. Our public, okay. Mr. Duran? So that concept of our public, um, struck a chord with me because I think it may be aspirational to say that our public is people who need a lawyer. I think it's more reality um, that our public is people who have lawyers that are 
not being responsive or not being ethical or not being competent, right? And even then, those folks sometimes just don't even know where to start. Um, and that's, you know, that's what struck me as Dad was saying. That. So okay. that's, that's a really good point. And, um, you know, also the thing that we found from the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group is the people who don't know that they need a lawyer, but they do need a lawyer because that's a huge part of the gap is the, the, the knowledge gap. It, it, it might even be an, a, a question to answer in the, the plan itself, and that is, who is our public? I think it's a great question, our public. Go ahead, Dag, sorry. Uh, no, that was all. Any other questions or feedback for Dag? Okay. So, Dag, um, you know this next part, you are really gonna have to help me with. <laughs> um, but I, we wanna start to hear from you, all of you. Um, you've, you've heard a lot, we've, we've put a lot of information in front of you um, and wanna start to get to that conversation about what the strategic priorities ought to be for the next five years. Um, I'm gonna give you a handful of my own high level takeaways um, just to, tee up this discussion and give you a chance to, to start to get your thoughts formulated. I would say first, what I noticed and heard, particularly in, um, in the conversations that I had to take, play, take part in, there's a great deal of faith in the staff um, and, and in the leadership. And I think that's a, that's a very good position to be in as an organization. Um, we, we've, we've seen instances where there's not the, that's not the case. Second, and you all teed this up a little bit yesterday, there's still some lingering, maybe even more than some lingering confusion around um, how the roles and responsibilities of the bar have changed since 2018. So that's just something to keep in mind, maybe not necessarily something to address in a goal, but something to, to keep in mind. And that may go to some of that simplification that you all talked about in clarity, to, to use um, Ms. Shelby's word, that we need to be sure is, is a part of this plan. Um, the other thing is more external. Um, there's a little bit of a generational transition going on just in, in sort of broader society. Um, and a lot of organizations are feeling those growing pains. And so, you know, this piece around making sure that you've got um, an electronic copy of this document, as well as a hard copy of this document, um, thinking about technology and when and how we, we, we use it and leverage it, it's just gonna be really important. Um, and that ought to be taken seriously. A couple of people, more than a couple of people have suggested that there's a need for an elevator pitch. Um, and I'm pretty biased as a professional communicator, but uh, I strongly agree here. And I think that just having that narrative is so important. Again, not a part of the, the plan, but just for us to think about as we start this work. And then um, I think the last thing is that um, we've got, a, got some work to do relative um, to our relationship with, um, with the legislature. And one of the folks that we spoke with, really, really good comment, um, just made the case that there are not a lot of practicing attorneys in the legislature anymore. Really, truly small, small group. And so making sure that there's real clarity around those is important to help improve there. So um, those are sort of my high level thoughts. And I did that just to buy myself some time, Dag, while we get set up for this next piece um, where we start to get some feedback. And are we gonna use, are we gonna change screens to do this? No, we'll, we'll, we can run this directly off of this screen, um, but okay. uh, you know, are you gonna use the first three prompts and then we're gonna go to the yes, four? Sir. Okay, yep. use I'm, the first I'm, three. I'm queued up for them. So you tell okay. me which one you wanna start with and and I'll tell people what they need to do. Let's go just with the, the first question more generally, and that was the one around important takeaways. Is that the first one? I've got it, yeah. Okay. So and we might need you to give us a little bit of a tutorial on what to do. Absolutely. So um, you are going to find uh, in your inbox, a lot of this exercise right now is gonna run through your inbox. And what you're gonna find in your inbox is an email that looks a lot like this. And um, it's got a link and it has a prompt with regard to what are the key takeaways. And so you heard about thought exchange. 
now you get to play with thought exchange. So you follow that link. And Leah, if you're looking for that, if you're looking for that email, you're not going to find it. I'm, I'm sending only to the <laughs> trustees. I, I saw that look on your face. Like, ah. Um, no, it's, it's only for the trustees. And um, you're going to follow that link and you're going to be given the prompt with regard to takeaways. And we encourage you to type in as many takeaways as uh, come to your mind, uh, important things. Uh, this is partly, I think, uh, Cassandra was hoping to get a single key takeaway. I don't think the platform really works that way. It, it's driven by the consensus and by the opinions of others with regard to the thought. So go ahead and enter as many key takeaways as you find that you have gotten from these this day and a half of training. And then once, what, once you're done entering your thoughts, uh, you'll be prompted, um, are you done entering thoughts? Or if you're done, you click on the done button and then you'll be fed other people's thoughts and, get, and asked to rate those on a, on a scale of one star to five, five being the one that you agree the most with, one being the one you agree the least with, but you'll be fed other people's thoughts. And as you start doing this, then I'm gonna share a screen and something super special is gonna pop up where we're gonna see in real time um, what these thoughts are. So this is the first of these. We're gonna give it a um, give it a go, see how it works, and um, stand by as I prepare to share the screen, showing you the uh, the presentation or the way that these uh, thoughts are coming over in real time. Is everybody clear on the instructions? No, Mr. I have Mr. no. Tony says no. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> You're gonna have to say that again. I have no my idea. apologize. I'm my apologies. You should share the screen while you're doing that, and everybody yeah. should find their link and go to the link, and then it'll make more sense. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the the email was sent to the mass distribution list that we have for you, so you can find it in your personal email. You can find it in your um, state bar email. Okay. I'm gonna. And this is how I'm going to send the following links for, for subsequent um, subsequent iterations of this exercise. And is everybody now pretty clear? And does everybody have their link? Okay. We'll just see what happens. How are you doing, Mr. Tony? I'll give it a shot. Are you going to share the screen, Doc? I yep. think. Okay. Yep, it's getting there. So this is, these are two users who are in and who have offered thoughts. These are the thoughts over here. We haven't yet had thoughts rated. We now have three users in. So three of the trustees are in and have provided four thoughts. Um, and these are the thoughts over here that they provided. Uh, these are entirely anonymous. I have no way of tracing any of the comments back. I should have mentioned that at the outset, but. Um, Jack, I think that that may be a little challenge for Bagley Keene. So do we have a way of uh, having people enter their name, who they are? Um, no, I don't think we did. All right. So. Maybe we can have Unless people they just write their them. name. Yeah, I have a suggestion. I'm I'm just putting my right. initials. I'm just putting my initials after what I'm typing. So you'll see RD at the end of mine. So what about what if we've already submitted them? Do it again. I mean, I think maybe you just take ownership of it, ownership of it as we're discussing it. So uh, again, what we're seeing populate here are purple trustees, um, blue thoughts. And what we haven't yet seen is because we don't have enough thoughts in the system yet, but we will shortly, is once the thoughts are done being generated, the sharing of the thoughts and the rating of the thoughts, and then these will start to get ranked uh, based on what the, the consensus is with regard to the thoughts that are, are, are most highly regarded. And are you able to scroll down? Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, now we've got our first thought that's been rated here. And this same person has now rated a second thought. Got it, okay. And so now... So I have to ask, I'm sorry, um, if I'm doing this on my phone, I'm not seeing other folks' thoughts, and so I don't know how to rate. Do you have I need to go to, to rate thoughts. You have to select off the menu. There was share thoughts, which is where you were entering your oh, thoughts. Okay. You All right, great, thank you. And we don't want to rush you, but we also want to push you to be as aggressive and assertive about getting your thoughts down as possible. This is starting to gel. Um, and, you know, I can set a timer on this if we want to fix an endpoint. Um, I'm going to say maybe two more minutes on this part. And I'm probably gonna, after that one, go to my question three, Dag. Okay. Are you supposed to rate your own thoughts? <laughs> I, I, I believe you can. We, when we tested this last night, um, we were saying that with a small yeah. group, you do get fed your own thoughts back. So don't be modest. Go ahead and give it a good rating. Now, again, I, we're not, we don't have the luxury of being on email. So can you scroll down a little bit so we can continue to see the thoughts as they come in? Of course. And in fact, I think um, this is, we can skip the sort of spider diagram and just look at. Um, I believe it's possible to rate thoughts without entering thoughts also. Um, yeah. if, if, if you happen to be one of these purple trustees out here on the edges who have not provided any thoughts, you should still be able to have access to other thoughts to rate them. And we will be able to clip and hold on to these thoughts, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, it looks like having set the timer, it is now closed. Okay. Let's scroll down slowly just to take a look. Okay. 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 Did everybody like that exercise? Is this helpful? I liked it. <laughs> Mr. Tony's wrinkling his nose. <laughs> it's it is again, we've we're embracing technology, sir. That's that's um that's definitely gonna be something we're all gonna have to do. You, I know I'm kind of old school too. Um <laughs> It's my bias against social uh, media. I don't do social media. So this feels like social media, voting on stuff, you know, on what people say and people just giving a real quick response without 
taking the time to think. I didn't like the speed of this. Okay, fair enough. Let's try one. Let's try another one, and uh, and we'll take that into account. And is there a second email, Dag? There, there is, and I just wanted to confirm: Are we talking the challenges exercise? Um, let's do challenges, but let's make that really quick as well, and then spend most of our time on the third. Okay, a set, a, a, another email has been sent. Uh, same basic drill. Uh, there's a link. You can follow the link. It will take you to a prompt asking you about key challenges right. facing the state bar. And while you're navigating to that, I'm going to navigate to the screen that will allow me to uh, display what we're looking at and the work that you're doing, the comments that you input. And try to keep your answers in, in a, that strategic space if possible is, is one thing I would ask. And I think we still want to make sure folks put their initials behind your statements. We have a timer going on this one. We do not. Yeah, I want to. Here we go. Let's do just two more minutes.
Looks like it froze. The timer's not going anymore. I wonder if that's because I browsed away. Oh, there we go. All right. And you said people couldn't multitask. <laughs> it's machines that can't multitask. <laughs> All right. All right. If you could scroll a little bit yep. so the rest of us who couldn't see could just take a look at it. Dealing with the legislature, adequately funding the discipline system. Yep. Reducing and eliminating backlog and the discipline compliance. Adequately, adequately funding the discipline system. Okay. Improving stakeholder relationships, improving the discipline system and addressing funding gaps, not necessarily in this order. The legislature's lack of trust in the state bar. Getting CTC confirmed. Reducing the backlog and partnering with the legislature to determine metrics that protect the public. Communicating an action plan and getting support from stakeholders. Lack of resources. Prioritization, tailored messaging, relationship building. Securing the funding necessary to bring the backlog down. Getting the case prioritization system right and accepted. Increased diversity of attorneys to reflect California diversity. Strategies to increase legal resources to people and communities with greatest need that don't increase corporate profit, define its role with respect to diversity, inclusion, access to justice, backlog, backlog, backlog. Okay. Fate of the licensing paraprofessional effort. And everybody's participating, so that's good. That's helpful. Okay. Any comments or questions on that one before we go to the last one? Mr. Chair, you like this one? Uh, no, I like the fact that Trustee Tony said he's not a fan of this, but he had a lot of comments in there, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I, but I didn't vote on anything. I won't do the voting. I draw the line uh, up. But I, didn't okay. I like the, um, this sort of consensus of uh, an idea or a focus on um, the backlog, the case processing standard, and when we think about benchmarks within the context of a five-year strategic plan, for me, what's coming up is sort of front-loading that work. And with the case processing standards development, we have that opportunity and focusing on the backlog. And then what does that doing so enable us to do, right? Because it, it gives us sort of room uh, to do some other things if we can get our house in order there. So that's what came up for me. Okay. And again, I'm going to challenge you to, you know, go up into the sky a little bit, as I like to say, and do some blue sky thinking as we, particularly as we take this next prompt. So um, go ahead and send your email. If you haven't already. The, the final of these first three emails has been sent <clears throat> before okay. we move on to actual um, strategic goals. And this prompt relates to state bar priorities. Mm -hmm. And again, go up into the sky with me a little bit. Go get less tactical and more around strategy and goal setting. Blue sky thinking, as I like to call it. You're sitting in an airplane, you're, you're over the Midwest and you've just got some time to do some big thinking. What, how should we be thinking about priorities over the next five years? at a high level. The prompt. Should I just go ahead and set the timer at the outset, Cassandra? Yes, please, please, yep. Keep it at, keep it at four? Yep.
So we have one person who's rated. Okay, there we go. There's a second person who's <laughs> begun rating. It's uh, one person who's rated a lot of thoughts. Now has rated all of the thoughts. And now the second person has begun rating. Well, we know who's not rating. Um, right. We'll keep an eye out for that purple trustee. <laughs> All right, time's up. Okay. So I think you know. I think what I'm starting to see is some some repetition. Um, so maybe mm -hmm. takeaways and priorities and challenges all kind of come together. But uh, establishing relationship of trust with the uh, collaboration with the legislature, funding for discipline programs, getting the trust and confidence of the legislature, improving stakeholder relationships, build relationships of trust and collaboration with other stakeholders invest in the discipline system so instead of it detracting from the work of the state court builds legitimacy and allows freedom for other projects for my ctc improving the discipline system raising the visibility of the state bar better protect the public through proactive support for attorneys discipline regulation pipeline and education all underscored by relationships and coalition building <laughs> distinguished state bar from its past and from other organizations with bar in their name Establishing better relationships with stakeholders, having an activist and engaged board, diversifying the profession, come up with strategy to address access to justice in rural areas that oftentimes serve diverse people and groups. Okay. Where is she? It, any feedback from you on that segment, Leah? No, just say I agree there's a lot of overlap in the three. Yeah. Saw that too. Okay. So any any general feedback before we go to the next segment? Did you like that exercise? Any other comments there? All good? Okay. So now Dag, I'm, it's gonna get tricky for me again, but one of the things that we did ahead of this conversation um, as a team, um, as your working group team and, and on the staff side is, is propose or we're about to propose four buckets um, for goals. And I think we wanna put them up on the screen and then maybe get, again, get some feedback on each of the buckets. Is that the way we're gonna do that one, Dag? Or can I talk about them first? Um, I, I'll, I'd have to create a slide to put them up on the screen. What, what I've done is I've created them in Thought Exchange. So they're set up in Thought Exchange to get feedback. Okay. I, Are I'm not, feeling like we should not go right into another thought exchange. So maybe we can just talk about them. Yeah. Because and they're not on. They're not on a. Um, they're not on a slide. No, but uh, I think that that can be remedied pretty quickly. Actually, I have them on a one pager. If I can share screen. 
You should be able to. Okay, let me just do that. At least I think I can. How's that? Looks good. Okay. So here are the four buckets we're proposing um, to place our goals in. And you will see some tactics and strategies underneath each, but what we wanna get your at least initial reaction to is the four, enforcement, transparency and accountability, innovation, and of course, DEI. We've also taken the liberty of at least beginning to define each of those areas um, that we might call out as goals for five years. Probably wanna get, we don't certainly don't wanna spend this time wordsmithing, but we do wanna just get some feedback around um, the definitions. And you'll start to see, I mean, if they were physical buckets, you know, there will, there will be um, several tactics and, and several of the ideas, many of the ideas that some of you just put up on the screen that would, would fit, and I'm starting to make some notes myself into those buckets. But let me first maybe solicit some feedback on the four areas first. Enforcement, transpar transparency and accountability, innovation and DEI. Any thoughts or initial feedback from the board? And now I'm not able, of course, to see everybody. So I, if, if my hand is up, let me know. I'll start with Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Cassandra. It, what's interesting to me is that um, this is a, I'm trying to get, I was trying to get on the phone. Sorry about that. Um, this is this is a different group of words than we've than we've been discussing uh, most of the morning and day. Um, all important words for sure, um, but taking us in a sort of in a different direction. I'm not sure if that was the intention of this next part, um, but it just there's a, a different phraseology than what I feel we've been focusing on. Give me then your four words because that's a fair, fair re reaction. Sure, um, relationships, accountability, uh, results, funding. Okay. And I'm just looking through any other, thank you. Sonia here. Good, please, Sonia, because I can't um, see. Thank you. I, I think I would also, I have the same, same thoughts, but uh, would also include, you know, being proactive, education, such that the attorney will not have to be, you know, disciplined, you know, <laughs> it's, it's more like what, let's, let's do some more efforts really in, and, and probably that's enforcing that we can put education and, and that's maybe into the weeds so much, but uh, the, it's all enforcement, but more for me. So what, what are the proactive things that we can do to so that these people will not fall into that? Okay. To being disciplined. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I at least have some support for the word enforcement. Okay. I see Mr. Soul and Mr. Cisneros next. Well, I was just going to come in sideways on the the word enforcement. <laughs> and, and, That's okay. <laughs> and uh, probably the, the the two word the two words that I think jump out at me that um, I kind of echoing what the chairman and, and others have said are the words enforcement and innovation. Uh, okay. Enforcement, just because I think public protection may be uh, more in line with uh, uh, how we sort of think about uh, the act of discipline and those sorts of things like that. And then innovation, just because for some reason, um, it, from what we're seeing in responses from some of our stakeholders, uh, that seems to be uh, something that they react to quite negatively. And I don't necessarily know that I have, uh, I have the word in mind to substitute for, uh, uh, for innovation, but um, that strikes me as something that uh, 
that, that others have reacted to in a, in a pretty uh, sort of vigorous manner. Let me go, so two things, you say potentially using the words public protection instead of enforcement, that, that, that makes sense to me. Say a little bit more about the response to innovation, just say a little bit more about that. You know, what we're seeing with uh, not only whether it's paraprofessionals or the access to justice, you know, sort of the sandbox, the regulatory sandbox and whatnot, that right. uh, those are innovations and uh, or they've been couched as innovations that, that folks have reacted to. And um, I just think we should, I think there's a way to describe them and maybe not use that word. Okay, got it. Uh, I think I saw Mr. Cisneros hand next, please. Thanks, Cassandra. Uh, I'll just add, I think I agree with a lot of the comments. I definitely was thinking public protection um, as, okay. as, a, as a maybe a broader and better word than enforcements. Um, and uh, innovation, um, I think is, is I think, yeah, it's, it, it feels a little um, techy and and like a easy go-to, um, and and I think that might may cause people not to, to take it seriously enough. I think that when I when I read the description behind it, access to legal services, uh, apps for legal services, um, you know, better processing around the admission process, um, and uh, and that type of thing. It just sounds like it's about doing, you know. Um, Delivering services better, um, delivering services in a more understandable and easy to access way. I think I might call that like accessibility, engagement, um, improvements, things like that. Innovation okay. just sounds like I'm just, you know, throwing some computer lingo in there for the hell of it. Um, I'm also a little bit um, excited about the topic that right now is called transparency and accountability. I think it could be broader. I think it could almost be closer to success and, and through things like transparency, accountability, and some mm -hmm. of the things that are called out, you know, um, strength, stronger relationships with stakeholders, um, you know, better connection, continual process improvement, better relationships with um, our, our, our funders. To, to Ruben's point earlier, funding is something we keep talking about over and over again, no matter what we're trying to do. And I don't think it deserves to be a top, you know, bullet point here, but it certainly is key to our success and our ability to do a lot of these things. So this might be a place where that success is going to be driven by things that are, that we could do better, the state bar could do better, but also things that could be delivered by stronger relationships and stakeholders. So let me go back to your first comment, because I, I like both and very much I like this feedback. It, I made a note to myself in the course of our discussions about changing that piece around innovation to access to justice. Yeah. Because I've heard you all use that term so much in these last two days. How does that float with you? I, 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 think, I think that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it rings true to us. I think the community, um, mm -hmm. both the employees and the stakeholders, I mm -hmm. think that that's what people are looking for this organization to deliver. And, mm -hmm. and I think, but I think obviously, you know, it's, it's a term that's been around for a long time. Someone needs to say, well, how are you going to improve that? What, what, what are you going to do different, differently? Got it. And, uh, and, but I think that's the right goal to be shooting for. Okay. All right. You know, I will hang on to your thought around success and hear from a couple other folks. Uh, Mr. Tony, please. Thank you. Um, I like the idea of categorization of um, you know of you know what we're trying to get done. I guess I kind of feel that it's premature to start categorizing, and that um, we should be spending more time talking about the priorities. I also don't know where some of these um, elements listed. We have not talked about it all. So I also, I, I don't know, maybe they should be discussed, but they should be discussed first. I, I really think we need to spend more time talking about what we wanna do, what we think is important. 
uh, more brainstorming and then do the categorization after we've come up with the list and let the categorization be driven by the content that we want rather than us developing content to put into categories. It, uh, appreciate it. And we'll just tell you that we're, a lot of this came from, again, was from the private conversations with, with uh, the, the staff on, you know, on our end. And um, a lot of this is also meant to start to just help us put some parameters around it. This is not hard and fast. It's not meant to um, even, even remotely be final, but it gives us something to react to. So we start to stop doing this and start to bring a little bit of, of form to it. But all the comments are, are helpful. And, and again, remember, this is not meant to be a, we're not gonna finish this day and have a final, um, we're not gonna have a final plan with a bow around it. This is really to get your feedback. So it's really actually very helpful if, if, if we can keep it going. Cassandra, I just wonder if it might be useful to take out the bullets because I, I do think they're kind of distracting right now at least to just talk about the categories that, you know, if these are the right categories, it sounds like they're not, cause I, cause I, I agree that we're not anywhere near looking at bullets. Okay. Um, Mr. Duran, Mr. Chairman. I think that was a useful suggestion, Leo. Thank you. A um, couple of thoughts. So, <clears throat> I think one of the reasons innovation didn't necessarily jump out at me initially is because it's something that I already take for granted with respect to this organization, largely because of the work that Leah uh, has pushed uh, over the past several years and certainly since she's come back. And so to me, innovation certainly is an important piece of what we're doing and what we should be doing. Um, and it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a given. And so that's why it wasn't necessarily foremost in my mind. Um, I did want to expand a little bit on the funding word that I brought up earlier. Okay. Um, and this is sort of echoing what I've heard uh, Trustee Shelby talk about in the past, and that is uh, it's, it's really resources, right? It's, certainly it's true that uh, financial resources are critical to our um, achieving our objectives, um, but our relational resources, our, our staff are resources. Um, so let's, I would just offer that if, as a, the refinement of my fourth word. So let me, so let's talk about uh, resources. And again, this is meant to be fluid. <laughs> if we were in a room together, we'd have a lot of white paper up around the wall and be, and be writing a lot of this stuff down that way. I'm taking notes, but I'm also wanna try to have this part that we're looking at reflect some of your thoughts here. So Mr. Chairman, where do you see the resource question at least potentially falling in one of these four areas, if if at all. The uh, transparency and accountability success. I feel like the more we are successful at our core mission of protecting the public, reducing the backlog, et cetera, building relationships, the more uh, the the more trusting the legislature and the state auditor are going to be when we make uh, requests for adjustment in our fee structure. It's success building on success. Okay. Do we need to call out the word resource, resources? I mean, I've identified it as an important word for me. I would certainly want to hear what the other trustees have to say. Okay. Mr. Stoll, you've had your hand up for a minute. I appreciate you allowing me to have a go back here. Um, the one thing that I'm not sure is uh, embedded in any of these, the headings right now, is uh, our administration of the bar exam and how we go about doing that. Um, and uh, I don't know if it if it if it's if it needs to be, but it you know in, in listening to some of the statistics the other day of how many folks take the bar exam and uh, how sort of how critical that is to to various aspects of of uh, public protection, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. I just wasn't sure whether or not that was something that we should be considering to be embedded in, in, in one of these headings. So does that, um, I'm looking at the first bullet or first bucket 
um, proactively protects the public by ma maintaining high standards in attorney admissions. Do we need to say more than that? At least to me, it felt like we should, but I, but I may be, may not be thinking about it um, uh, correctly since I'm, since I'm not an attorney. Any other feedback there? Should we say more? All right, I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, Mr. Tony's had his hand up and then I see a couple of others. Uh, I'm gonna defer until people who haven't spoken yet speak. Okay, let me see. Mr. Stallings? Yeah, so just to echo Arnie's point there, um, I think admissions is a substantial portion of the consumer protection that the state bar offers. Um, and then I think there's also, I feel a lot of different calls and emails from people wondering different things about the state bar. And I think 50% of them have to do with the moral character um, applications and uh, just different licensee uh, type issues. So, hey, I just got sworn in. Uh, when can I expect my bar number? Um, so I think we shouldn't lose sight of of being a very effective licensee, being effective at admitting people to the practice of law, and then um, the public protection aspect of the, uh, you know, the of the discipline system. So, I mean, I, I think that goes kind of in enforcement, but I think it, it could also be a standalone thing because the other thing I don't see here is the um, accreditation of law schools. Now there's certainly a crossover with innovation and access to justice. Mm -hmm. So I can see it going both in public protection and uh, access to justice. Okay. Sorry. And Mr. Broughton. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I too was taken with that word innovation and I immediately thought of the issue that we're gonna to have to be dealing with um, in a while with respect to some of these uh, projects we've taken on. The other thing is when I look at these, what we have here, public mm -hmm. protection, transparency, innovation, innovation, diversity and inclusion, all we've done is put up bullet points that are our mission statement, which is the State Bar of California mission is to protect the public, and includes primary functions of licensing, regulation, and discipline of attorneys. That's your first one. The advancement of the ethical and competent practice of law. That's also probably your first or second. Um, and support the efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. So it seems to me that all this is, is a sort of a bullet point of the mission statement that we've already got. To me, I think goals are something more specific. And I happen to agree with Mr. Tony that we probably are putting the cart before the horse and should be finishing our discussions, which drives our goals for the next five years, which is kind of what we did when we got the first five-year plan. So I'm not seeing that this is any uh, a reflection of the, the exercises that we just did mm -hmm. uh, or that it's anything, quite frankly, other than the mission statement that already directs the state bar. Okay, I'm gonna take your point and Mr. Selek. Yeah, so, well, you know, I think Mark has kind of hit the nail on the head uh, is, my, uh, is my big picture reaction that, that there are some things in here that aren't in the mission statement to be sure, but so that's my big picture comment. And then, uh, uh, for the second bucket, someone mentioned results. I think that would be a better title for the second one. In other words, you know, like Yoda, there's no try, there's only do. So the idea of that is we want to measure results objectively. And then um, the third bucket, I think, is kind of mixing up two different ideas. One is, uh, I mean, really, it says access to justice, but the text is about internal operation of the bar, I think. Yes, so that's, that's just kind of a muddle. 
I don't even know what we're doing there. So that's just my, just my thoughts. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna go to Ms. Shelby and then I'm gonna come back to you, Leah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for not being on screen. I am declining quickly. Um, but the when I look at the categories, what came to mind for me was oversight, accountability, results, and resources. Those were the things that kind of came top of mind to me. And, you know, as I hear Mark, Mark squared their comments, um, I certainly think it can be approached from two different ways. If we're going down this route, I would say oversight, accountability, results, and resources are kind of how I see our goals. But um, if we get into more kind of strategic conversation, I'm comfortable doing that as well. Thank you. And I hope you um, are, get, are resting while you're off screen. Um, Ms. Wilson. I was just gonna say that I think this is really challenging because our current strategic plan is much more organized around our functional areas. And I think that's what I'm hearing from some members of the board. Like we have goals around admissions. We have goals around increasing access to legal services diversity. Yes, you know, Mark, drawing from the strategic plan, the sort of construction organization. And then where that varies is there is a goal around communication and relationships in the current strategic plan that's not in the mission statement. And there were some goals around separation of the state bar, not in the mission statement. This has some values as well as functions, right? You know, we have a function around DEI, function being it's part of our mission statement. It's also a value. Innovation and transparency, accountability, these are values in the way we do our work, not necessarily our functional responsibilities. Then enforcement of public protection is obviously functional. So I think that's one of the challenges in this conversation as well is like are the are we is our strategic plan oriented around our values and then the initiatives that we are gonna undertake to advance those values or is it organized around our functional responsibilities? So Brandon, when you say, I don't see law school you know, oversight in here, where would it fit? It may be that everything we do doesn't fit in the strategic plan. Right. And that, that doesn't mean we don't do it, it's just not, part of, you know, sort of what we're calling out as the high level goals for the next five years. But I just think that's kind of the tension because um, this looks really different than what we have. And it does differ from the conversation we've been having, which I think is more about like our relationships, how to define who we are and what our value is. And um, certainly the conversation around increasing access to legal services. Mm -hmm. So. And I think I appreciate that, Leah. The other thing I think I would say is strategic plans, as, as Travis shared with you, can be a lot about, uh, very, very aspirational, but also measurable. Um, but for me, they answer the question quite simply, what do you want to do? What do you want to do over the next five years? And and then you will fill in with the operations piece around how you do it. And a lot of that will be what you're already doing. But what do you want to do over the next five years is the question that, I, I, that we, I'd like to try to see answered. And all the conversations that we've had over the last um, couple of days are certainly going to inform how we fill in these buckets. But we do want to, as I said earlier, put some parameters around what are, your, what are your four or five areas of priority? I am losing track, so let me see. I think I see Mr. Tony's hand again. Yes, thank you. The, um, I guess I um, wanted to start responding to uh, uh, Chair Duran's uh, comment um, around resources. How do we talk about resources? And I think the most important way to talk about resources would be to really uh, commit ourselves and to put in writing 
the State Bar's commitment to the strategic deployment of resources in the most efficient way possible to achieve our goals. I think that's what people want from us. I, I don't think it quite frankly makes sense to have a strategic goal of getting more resources, okay? Nobody's gonna give you more resources if you cannot demonstrate the strategic deployment in, a co in, a, in an efficient uh, manner. That's what we need to focus on. So that would be my um, uh, recommendation to respond to uh, Chair Duran's uh, question about how do we address the issue of resources. And I, and I still believe that having these categories up impedes our ability to have a discussion about what it is we want to do, what we think is important. The categories can come afterwards and the categories can come organically and be labeled organically after we've got these. But I, I find this not useful to have these up. Mr. Broughton, sorry. Once again, I agree with Mr. Tony. I don't know what's happening here. Um, okay. <clears throat> then that's supposed to. I, I looked at I looked at these when I first looked at them, and I thought, "What in the heck are we doing here?" I, I this completely confused me as to what we have just done for the last day and a half, and so forth. With respect to Miss, you know, when I read or saw the first um, five-year plan or whatever it was, mm -hmm. we talked about visions of success. And the question there was, what do, you, what do you want to have happen? Where do we want to get? And that's what Mr. Tony is talking about. And so I put down, um, we want 90% of all claims completed within the statutory time limits in terms of regulation. We want as many people as possible to have access to attorney and to attorneys and legal system. Three, we want more representative, diverse licensee population. To me, those are aspirational goals that go into a five-year plan, or maybe I'm just completely missing what we're supposed to be doing here. Because we have, we have values, our values are stated in our mission statement. So to me, this whole thing is a little bit confusing. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to confuse you. If we were in a room together, I think I would say again, that some of this would wind up in a lot of paper in a lot of places. And we just don't have an effective way to sort of get everybody's thoughts down. Some of it's here, some of it's here. Um, and again, some of it's some of why we put these words up just to get us started was to start to put some parameters around our goals. So let me turn the question back to you and say, um, what do you want to do over the next five years that isn't represented in these categories, and I'll turn the question, ask the same question to Mr. Tony. Well, maybe I'll turn it back on you and say, um, is there not some specific goals that can be derived from the information that received from all of the trustees over the last you know, day and a half? Most Are there definitely. three goals that I just gave to you not something that are aspirational goals that you can break down and measure and accomplish within the next five years. Most definitely. I, I for me, the most important, the, uh, in, in, to your point, the first bucket, if you will, calls out a lot of what you do already that's a part of your mission. What probably resonates with me the most is the second, and, and in particular, this piece around um, consumer fo focused strategies and communications, or as Mr. Tony said strategic deployment of resources and in particular strengthening relationships among stakeholders. That, that, would be where, that would be where I'd start to answer your question. Now, Leah, one of the things you asked us not to do, and, I'm in, and I'll take your lead here, is not to use the thought um, exchange process to go through some of this. Do you still feel like we should or shouldn't? No, I guess I'm feeling like what we're hearing from the board is that there's a disconnect between what they're seeing here mm -hmm. and all the discussion we've had. So I kind of like the idea of taking this down and maybe we have, um, I don't know what the best way to do this is in um, Zoom. We could have nothing up, 
but somebody, I'm happy to be the somebody really taking notes about the conversation and then at some point putting something up. But I think just having some real conversation with the trustees about where do you want to be in five years? What do you see as our priority areas of focus to start trying to get us something that we can crystallize? And I, I get, I'm happy to take the notes so that you can actively facilitate that, Cassandra, or whatever. But that's kind of what I'm thinking we should do at this point is just kind of get some dialogue going. But that's just me. So, and I'm not a with, member of the board. In, in full disclosure is where I wanted to start, but we did get, we got stuck on the thought exchange idea. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Let's go back to that. I am happy to do a course correct and start to talk and, and do what I like to do. And that is go around the Zoom room and just have the trustees share. And even if it is a repeat of what you shared on the thought exchange, um, give me a sense of priorities. What do you wanna do in the next five years? that this is what this is the kind of conversation I'd rather have. And I'm gonna start again with the chair. And I know Travis is covering me on notes as well. Sure, thanks. Uh, I think in, uh, in the next five years, we need to have a handle on the backlog. It's just, we, we can't escape that that is uh, a measurement that lots of folks are interested in. Certainly um, it is a measure of how well we're protecting the public. Um, I don't know that I can necessarily put a number to the tracking of, you know, the percentages. That's, um, I've never been good at math, but making, you know, significant, um, significant improvement there. Um, in five years, are we, are, I want to have, I want the, the board as a, as a group of people, they'll probably mostly be different people then, but I want them to have, um, you know, an effective functioning, good relationship with, with the legislature or with the legislative staff, with the judiciary and, and the other important committees in the legislature that we have to work with um, on a day-to-day -day basis or on a regular basis, at least. I wanna see um, a more diversified profession. You know, I wanna see more men and women of color um, and um, more uh, socioeconomic, socioeconomically disadvantaged people coming into the profession, right? Um, that's an important, that's an important piece of where our state needs to go. Those are just some initial thoughts. Okay. That's three. Good. Mr. Tony. Thank you. Um, what, what I would request is I, I, I do want to, um, I, I do have some thoughts, but, um, I'd like to ask the chair since we've been meeting without a break for uh, two hours and 40 minutes, if maybe we could have a break and I could come back and be first, if that's okay. That'd be great. Do we want to do a regular break or a stretch break? What's the difference? <laughs> we'll play a video. Oh, we'll like a, yeah, no, let's do a regular break. Like give folks a chance to get up and move around and take okay. care of, um, take care of business. Let's say, uh, 15 minutes, 15. Thank you. Okay, thanks. don't know, Zoom um, will allow you, once he's got that document up to, because it's also important that we see each other. 
So I don't know if most of you know, there's that little line between where the, Dag, put your, your dock back up for a second. There should be a line that you sort of between Dag's screen and everybody else's screen where you can sort of move, make, make that sheet of paper larger and smaller, but in making it a little bit smaller, give us a chance to see each other. Does everybody see what I mean if you don't? And I, so I just, it's important to me to be able to, to see you. We think it's important for you to see each other, but we also want to start to get some notes as though we were in the room. And, and Cassandra, just for those who may not have that already set up, if you go to the top right corner of, of your Zoom screen where it says view, you want to select side by side gallery. And then and then you can also move move it the way you suggested. Yep. Does everybody understand that? So it gives us a chance to see each other, but we'll still see what we're taking down. And Mr. Stalin, do you have your hand up, sir? Yeah, I just wanted to get in line behind uh, Mark. Got it, okay. All right, so you will see then that we've got Mr. Chair's remarks already down. Um, the way this would typically work is we get everybody's feedback and we'll start to see some themes um, develop and, um, and we'll take it from there. So let's keep going and go with um, Mr. Tony, who we were gonna hear from right before the break. Thank you. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that we think about this question of, uh, think of two aspects when it comes to the question of um, attorney accountability. There's one aspect of attorney accountability that has to do with Ha, uh, the attorney discipline system and uh, that we've talked a lot about and how to become more efficient in processing uh, attorney complaints and reducing the backlog. We've talked a lot about that. But I think there's a flip side to that. And that flip side is to recognize that what, when, whenever a person, uh, a client complains about an attorney, it's already a failure. Okay, there's already been a failure. And that part of what we want to do is to make sure that the bar has, does more attorney support to prevention is what I'm trying to say. We spend a lot of time on prosecution and yes, discipline is important, but we also need to spend time with prevention of, um, so that when we're looking at the discipline system, it's not only disciplining attorneys that have complaints against them, but what can we do in terms of support education uh, to echo what some of the um, other trustees have said uh, for attorneys, um, what kind of accountability, what kind of reporting requirements we should consider increasing, um, you, know, which, we, you, know, you know, which we have some work already happening, um, uh, on, you know, and particularly around client trust accounts, where we know that's a big issue. Um, and it's not limited to a single individual, but there's a systematic issue we ought to be dealing with. So uh, I, I think that's a key thing I want to say. Of course, I have many other things, but for now, that's what I wanted to say. So I hear you saying attorney support, education, and prevention, prevention of what? Complaints? Uh, no, prevention of um, uh, uh, breaking the law. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Stallings, you said you wanted to go next. All right. Thank you. So we've, we've heard about reducing the backlog, and I think that Reducing the backlog really comes down to a resource issue. And so I think we really need to take a hard look at reallocating resources that have been entrusted to us, whether through uh, the uh, fees, the licensing fees, um, or any uh, potential sale of assets uh, down the road. And I think we need to invest back into the discipline system uh, to with, with the sole goal of uh, reducing the backlog through efficient processing of complaints. 
the timely investigation of those cases, consistent uh, resolutions, and then effective uh, litigation at trial. And then develop, uh, you know, continue to refine and develop um, the excellent work of OCTC, um, you know, the strides that they've made to modernize the, uh, the discipline system using the technology uh, that they have. Um, I think there's, there's ways to continually refine and be, uh, be more efficient. Okay. So that, that'd be my top one. And then this isn't necessarily like um, second in priority, but just one that I really want to keep on um, the radar is access to justice in rural areas. And I know what you mean by that, but how? Just curious. Through a uh, through a strategy involving a new program that would uh, either be a scholarship or a loan repayment type program that would incentivize uh, lawyers especially lawyers who are from particular rural areas to stay in their community and to meet the needs of the diverse populations of those rural communities. And is this also a resource issue? Yes. Okay, thank you. Got it. Anything else? Uh, that's it for now. Okay, I see Mr. Saleh. Thank you. So I jotted down some ideas. Um, restore credibility, which is a little vague, but I think we all know the issues there. Um, establish new metrics for the discipline system that are both acceptable to our oversight bodies and achievable with current or augmented resources. Uh, resource, restore credibility with? Uh, public and the legislature. Okay. Um, this is another big one, but make meaningful progress in closing the justice gap. And you don't have to type what I'll say now, but that, that covers a lot. We have some programs underway about which some legislative leaders have expressed concern. So that's gonna be a subject of discussion, like how we go about that. Um, the next is one- that, Is that a resource question? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so, Leah. I think that's a policy issue. More. At this okay. point, yeah, I don't think it's it's not primarily a resource issue. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if this is too in the weeds. So Leah and Cassandra give me feedback, but I would include diversify senior leadership of the state bar. And the final one is synthesize work and recommendations arising from the special case audit, which you don't have to write this down, Cassandra, is the Girardi audit, um, with recommendations from the ad hoc commission on the discipline system. Okay. And here again, I'll expand on that, but you don't have to write this part down, that Leah has noted, we have two groups that are working on recommendations for the discipline system. And one, you know, arising from the Girardi situation is, is get tougher, be stricter. And there's a lot of work being done on the discipline commission that is a little bit contrary to that to improve both fairness and efficacy of the discipline system. You know, for example, shifting uh, from, you know, uh, not just focusing on discipline to protect the public, but also preventative 
work and um, rehabilitation type efforts to avoid repeat offenses. So that's kind of a big, I think that's ultimately gonna be a board task. And Leah, if you have any views on that, I think so. I think the board's gonna, it's gonna be the board's job to sort that out at the end of the day. Okay. I agree with you and I, yeah, I'll just say that for now. That's it. Thank you. Straightforward. I'm going to try to go in what I think is order. So Ms. Chen. So I've been jotting stuff down and I have been trying to phrase it in because I think it helps me think in terms of high level, big picture, where would we like to get to? Um, mm -hmm. I really like that first example of a strategic plan that you showed for CalSTRS or CalPERS where it talked about, you know, we would, this is the organization we would like to be five years in the future. And so I sort of phrased my ideas in those terms. Good. Um, one, and this, you'll see a lot of overlap with what you've heard already. Um, one is that the public really views and understands the state bar as an access, as a resource for access to justice. So when people think of, boy, I really need help, uh, they turn to the state bar and you know to build on Brandon's idea of ensuring access to justice in rural areas and other underserved areas I think we need to ask ourselves for example does the current website serve that goal you know you go to the lawyer referral site and it's grouped by county well given how well remote working has worked and given how well we've been able to um, work while you know just isolated in our homes and offices, is it, does it really make sense to isolate things by county? Or can we be providing legal services um, over the internet? I know that in the healthcare field, people are really talking about the growth of telemedicine. Now that you can really effectively deliver healthcare services in many instances um, through Zoom appointments. Um, so I would like the Cal Bar to be looked at as a resource for access to justice. Okay. Um, second, I would like, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but if, if the organization could become an organization that attorneys, so the attorneys who we regulate, think of the Cal Bar as a resource for them. And I wanna echo something Mr. Broughton said yesterday, for many of our colleagues, and this goes for virtually every single one of my colleagues, they have no idea the depth and breadth of what the state bar does. To them, there are three times when they touch the state bar. One is when they've taken the bar exam. And then every year, or every few years, well, every year they pay fees. And then every few years, they have to put in their CLE certification. And for many attorneys, that is their only interaction with the state bar. And so they have no idea what they do, what the state bar does. And I think one of the ways to increase visibility, while at the same time, achieving the goal of better protecting the public is through this proactive regulation, the preventative measures, the providing the, hey, you've got this problem, here's a checklist, here's some, we're gonna help you get it right, rather than only focusing on, we're gonna talk to you when you get it wrong. Right. And then the last item is, I would love to see an office of the chief trial counsel that feels motivated and supported in achieving the goal of protecting the public. And I think you can get to an office that feels motivated and supported. I mean, one thing we've talked a lot about is resources. Right. Another thing to keep our eye on though, is making sure we're going after the most serious cases and prioritizing those. And eventually building a relationship of collaboration and trust with various stakeholders, including the legislature. That's what's gonna get us to an office of chief trial counsel that feels motivated and supported. Um, which of the three is going to require more resource or is this the matter of, as someone said earlier, just being more strategic about or reallocating of? I'm not sure. Okay, so that's the right answer, that's fine, okay. Thank you. Again, I'm trying to go in order. I think Mr. De La Cruz was next. Okay, thank you. So 
I, building off of, um, of everyone's conversation here, I think one of the things that you know we continue to see is the ability to get the chief trial counsel approved by the legislature. So I think that should be part of the conversation or or developing a plan or however working with the legislature to make sure that that happens. I think stabilizing that the OCTC is going to be instrumental as we move forward in the next five years. Not that it's not um, stabilized, but I think you know perception is reality, and when you can't confirm someone, uh, it's a problem. And so I think that that'll be key in the next five years. I, uh, um, hey, Lynn also mentioned, but I also wrote down public understanding of what and how the state bar board supports the public, especially access to justice. Um, that's the other point I have. Creating a program or implementing a program that encourages youth to become attorneys, especially underrepresented populations. That's another one. Um, and then a healthy working relationship with the legislator, advocate groups, and attorney associations to support and better protect the public. Okay. I, I missed the last one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it again. No word, Dad. Healthy working relationship with the legislator, uh, advocate groups, and attorney associations or associations uh, to support and better protect the public. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dalen. Thank you. Again, uh, amplifying what everyone has already said, but for me, it's the backlog. Uh, getting that, you know, funded and and at the same time, I we have always been saying, well, because it's really not the backlog or not this, it's, it's just a little bit more of we have been saying what we're saying and they're saying and and of course that's they're saying what they're saying, but at least we have to have a meeting of of the minds here where we can really work with. Uh, alternatives so, so that we can have a more permanent solution to it or advancing really um, the, 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 you know, the, the cases, the most serious cases, and then bring down the backlog. So it's the same, same thing. Um, communicate, communicating effectively with the public in terms of access to legal services, educating the public and how, why, when <clears throat> they need legal services and making sure that um, they know how to get it uh, done and then be protected. So again, um, resources, website, and for me, more town hall-like, more being visible to the public, whether it's by social media, but there is the thing that, you know, to, to give the public a clearer understanding of what the state bar is. And, and then that the state bar is really for protecting them. And, and, and so, and, and I heard, you know, some people just don't know that when they really need legal service. Um, so it's effective communication, better communication and visibility to the public. I'm a proponent also of support for our lawyers, preempting, being proactive in, and preventing them from committing any illegal acts. Some of them may not be really, um, I mean, it's because of it, when them being very professionals and everything is not ignorance, but, but, but the kind of thing that we can help prevent them commit any um, illegal acts. And also uh, improving the relationship with the legislature and, and the court and being so that we will be more uh, effective in getting all our policies and pu push our policies and getting um, better allies. And at the same time, identifying and working closely with uh, the California Bar Association in supporting the lawyers. So I think that's also in the supporting the lawyers and being able to, uh, you know, probably collaborate with them in some programs that will really support the lawyers. 
Thank so you. Your first um, was also this bag backlog piece. Are you um, in agreement with Mr. Stallings that that's going to require a reallocation of resource, or is there another way you see to do that? Um, well, one is to really understand our position and whenever we do, we explain to them why it is not that the, that the backlog is caused by, you know, this 180 days and all and, and that. And, and yet they are coming back with their own perception or their own analysis of why we are having this. So reallocation, we always say we need more. Uh, one, and also what is it really that we can have a better solution by having probably really, probably what we're saying is not being heard or what we're saying probably we have to, um, to, to have you know, a better way of letting them understand why we really need this? Why, why is it that we need these resources? Why we need more funding and all that? I mean, then we know the why it is, but the how we can effectively tell them exactly, it is because of, of, of all this uh, impediments that we're not able to uh, you know, get a better solution to this one. I'm also thinking of probably creating a group that is for the less serious ones, you know, so that the cases will be heard and be dispensed of quickly. And probably that will, you know, getting that done and getting the resource, getting the people who are working on those things to just get all those case, say, cases closed that can be closed so that all those resources now can be moved to the more serious cases also. I think because of, you know, combining the, combining some, probably the lawyers working on the different cases I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, there are some cases that are maybe not being looked at because we're all concentrating on the most serious ones. But there are also other cases that needed to be seen, needed to be uh, analyzed, needed to be uh, looked into, and then dis dispensed. Okay. Leah, you've had your hand up for a while, Ms. Wilson. Well, I don't want to um, interrupt the process, but I just made a note around this term of access to justice, and it kind of goes to something that Mark Tony's called, uh, brought up a few times around who is our public and how do we define that? I want to have the board think about the term access to justice. Are we talking about justice writ large? Are we talking about access to legal services? Are we talking about access to lawyers? And those distinctions matter. Are we talking about access to the courts? A lot of the pushback we've gotten on our regulatory reform work, which is really about increasing access to legal advice, which is a regulated activity, um, has been, well, you should be focused on increasing resources for court self-help centers, or you should be for, focused on increasing resources for court navigator programs. Those are uh, access to the courts, uh, which is quite different than access to lawyers. All of that falls under access to justice. And access to lawyers is very different than access to other actors who can deliver legal services. Um, we have non-lawyers in that space now delivering legal services, but not legal advice. And through regulatory reform, you can have non-lawyers providing legal advice. So I just think we need to kind of grapple with what we're talking about. And so it's kind of a, a definitional uh, question, just another one to put on the table. Well, and, and uh, Ms. Chin talked about, I'm gonna say it, you know, leveraging technology to broaden access. Right, and, and you can leverage technology, just have lawyers meet with clients via right. Zoom. That right. doesn't actually require regulatory reform. You can leverage technology in a way that that implicates regulatory reform because you have tech delivered legal service, legal advice. So there's right. like a lot that's going on in this space. And I just do think it would be important for the board to really think about in five years, where do we want to be or what are we talking about here? That's a good comment. I'm gonna, I'll put a pin in that, come back to it and um, call
call on Mr. Stallings and then Mr. Broughton. Sorry, I think that speaking of technology, I think technology automatically raised my hand. But no, so to get to Leah's uh, point, um, I guess when I talk about rural areas, I think it really does encompass all those things. Uh, but in my hierarchy, I would say um, access to legal advice. So expanding the number of lawyers in a particular geographic area, and whether that's uh, you know there in the geographic area or that can service that particular geographic area. Um, I don't know if we need to make that distinction, but just ways to uh, funnel legal advice to the most vulnerable communities. So access to legal advice does or doesn't mean access to a lawyer? Um, I would say, yes, it does involve access to a lawyer. Okay. Mr. Broughton and then Mr. Cisneros. Thank you. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with exactly what Leo was talking about. In fact, you can see my paper here, you probably can't. Scribbled all over it is access to justice. And my question is that I wrote down here was, what does that mean with respect to the state bar? What are we supposed to be doing as a state bar? We need to define that term and define what it is that we're gonna uh, do as a state bar. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the things we're talking about and some of the issues that we're gonna have to deal with, with programs that we already started were access issues that now um, we have to decide whether we can do them or not. So I really think um, defining what that means, because our mission statement says, support efforts for greater access to the legal system. So what does that mean in terms of, um, that's gotta direct the, the various programs that we do. I what really like what- What does it mean to you? Let me just stop you and ask you, what does it mean to you? Oh my God, you're, you're bringing back some um, PTSD issues for me because when, when we went through this, the five-year plan that we did before, five-year strategic plan that came sort of together with um, the um, governance task force. We were creating a new organization and essentially we were, we were breaking up the bar. We were going from a unified bar that included everything to essentially a regulatory agency with the addition of this nebulous concept of access to justice. I mean, the medical board doesn't have to deal with those issues. Did the doctor screw up somehow? And so we go after his license. The board of registered nursing, you know, um, automotive repair, you go down any of these, they don't have the issues that we do with respect to having to deal with access to automotive repair. Um, so I actually got in some difficulty with other board members because I said, if we are a regulatory agency, we are not dealing with access issues. Those are issues that should be dealt with by other organizations or other committees and so forth. Ultimately, we did include that portion in our mission statement that is now statutory that says access to an inclusion in the legal system. But that's created so many problems for us that we're dealing with right now. Um, are we a regulatory agency or are we this hybrid? We're the hybrid right now. Um, but I would like to state that I, I think somewhere along the line, we have to say that um, that regulation of attorney discipline is our number one priority. And that, that is got to be it. Um, I like the way Sean presented it. If, if, if I were gonna say, what is access to justice? I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to. I would like to go to the legislature and say, you know what? Here in Fresno County, we used to have nine separate little justice courts one of which was way out in Kalinga, California. It's about 70 miles from the, the main courthouse downtown here. And there were all these little justice courts all over in Riverdale and Clovis and, and Fowler that all of these people, 
these farm workers and these, these people who don't have cars and can't travel, that they could go to their justice court. And those justice court had attorneys that were around them that would service their communities. We don't have those anymore. You closed them all. And now these people have to come to the one single courthouse downtown. And many of them can't get here. And they don't have attorneys out in their areas. You, legislature, should put that back. You need to put those things back to give those people access to justice. That's what I'd like to say. But we don't have, you know, we don't have the ability to do that. Um, so what does it mean to me? I think, I think it requires, as Leah pointed out, a greater discussion. What does it mean? And what does it mean for the bar? What can and can we not do um, when our main goal is the disciplining of attorneys. One other thing I wanted to say, and I think something that should, should be included is to increase the uh, amount that the uh, Legal Services Trust Fund can pay back. Um, right now, you know, I think, I don't have the exact numbers off my head, but we're only about three, four million dollars a year. And there's something like, uh, and Leah can get, throw out the numbers, $20 million of claims every year. And these poor people are waiting three, four, five years for reimbursement from the Client Security Fund. It would be nice uh, to, as a goal, to try and increase uh, or, or make more quickly um, our ability to pay back those claims. Um, with respect to the attorneys um, being, um, so, so to speak, educated, that's why we have CLA. That's what we split off in, in a large part, the education component um, and the trade association component for attorneys. So we could somehow interface with CLA to accomplish some of those goals, the prevented goals uh, that we talked about. So anyway, sorry to go a little bit far afield, but you asked me about access and that's what happens. Could I just make one quick observation with regard to this this challenge? Of, and I'm sorry for jumping in line, but you, you pointed to the challenge of being a regulatory body that has this part of its mission, which includes access to justice and the potential contradiction contained within that. I, I thought it was quite interesting that the way that the legislature dealt with that con contradiction, and I, I, I'm quite sure that they saw it as well, is that when they changed the language regarding our mission in business and profession 6001.1, they said, it, for the longest time, it had said public protection is the number one priority of the state bar. And when they changed the language to add access and inclusion into that, they kept public protection is the number one pr priority of the state bar. But they said public protection, which is understood to include access to and inclusion in the legal system, is the number one priority of the state bar. So they, to, to some extent, they sort of punted by saying there's no difference. It's the same thing. Public protection includes those those elements. So I just wanted to point that out because that is in the business and professions code, and that's how the legislature attempted to resolve that. Well, you know, you remember that we um, we went around and around and around the Mulberry Bush, and we didn't have it to begin with. I don't remember what came first, the statute or our um, designation or our, our designation came first. So um, the legislature followed. Yeah. So we we. Um, that there was a big fight over that term and what what it meant to the bar and it still is i still see it i still feel it um so i think i do agree with with leah that we have to figure out what that means we still don't know and until we know i i, I don't know how we direct um what we're going to do i mean we have a problem right now that we've got to deal with that came at us out of left field that that, that has to do with this if if that is one of our primary purposes to um, gr uh, promote greater access to justice, those two particular programs were exactly designed to do that, to, to design to look at other ways to provide access to justice to people who didn't have it. So for example, the people out in Kolinga that can't get to court, well, maybe they can use an alternative. These are the things that we're studying. And now we have to decide are we going to do that, or are we going to have to go back as directed and and bolster up the um, the discipline system? So we we have that problem. I, I don't know how to resolve it other than until we define it specifically, uh, we're going to have that problem over and over. If it's a if it is a priority, and several of you have mentioned it, then we are going to have to define it. I want to keep moving 
and we'll come back to that question um, in a bit. Mr. Cisneros and then Ms. Shelby, please. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll be, I think I'll be fairly quick. People have covered a lot of material and I'm not going to try and add too much to that, but rather I was spending my time thinking about a way to kind of organize our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the model I came up to is kind of grouping them into three topics. The first one being support of the legal profession itself. The second one being support of the public and the third being engagement with uh, partners to achieve success. And the first one, um, support of the legal profession. Uh, I think what goes in there is a lot about what everyone's talked about. How do people enter the legal profession? Um, is that an exam? Is it some other way of entering the legal profession? What are the ongoing educational sources that we can either provide to them or refer them to, to mark your point about CLA and their role? How do we support um, attorneys, particularly you know, those with um, you know, not a lot of resources, not part of a big firm, um, maybe not a lot of experience, uh, maybe even as I know some of our um, programs already do, you know, struggling with you know, substance abuse or whatever. But also I think we support the legal industry by also providing an adequate amount of oversight and making sure that they're, you know, as we talked about a lot in the client trust account um, protection program, um, making sure that they have the resources to do that the right way, making sure we help them understand what their obligations are. Uh, the, the other jurisdictions we spoke to actually found that when they put client trust protection programs in place, they spent most of their time helping people do it right not you know disciplining people for um, stealing money or anything like that so i think that category is very of course very broad and a lot of other people have mentioned things ways we support attorneys i think the way obviously we, we protect and support the public is a lot of what everyone's been talking about access to legal services um, making referrals to people for for you know legal assistance help attorneys whatever form that's going to take going forward um, dealing with people who've been wronged, you know, uh, registering complaints, following up on complaints, maybe even uh, providing restitution, uh, you know, so the whole the way we deal with the public, the way we support the public, the way we educate the public, the way we maybe tell the public, you know, don't talk to anybody for legal advice until you verify that they're on the, the, the State Bar website as a certified legal provider of legal services, you know, if you, if you, don't check there first, you know, you're just asking for a boatload of trouble. You know, maybe that's an advertising campaign, but, but we've got to do a better job of supporting the public. And I think a lot of people have already talked about ways to do that. And then I think the other one, uh, constituency that we're really, you know, challenged with, of course, a lot of the time is engaging and collaborating with our partners. And, and those run the gamut, you know? I mean, the obvious ones, the legislature, the judicial system, even the executive branch, the state government, you know, the folks that, that support us to pass laws that, that provide, help us provide uh, and laws and statutes to help us provide the services and, and make available the resources and collect the fees and, 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 and provide the protections. Um, all of that, uh, you know, is, is critical for us. Uh, but I think we've got other stakeholders too that people have brought up over and over again, other bar organizations, um, you know, um, uh, law schools are, 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 are partners of ours. Um, you know, consumer organizations are partners of ours. Community groups are partners of ours. Every judge in the state is a partner of ours and, and on and on and on. And so I kind of, I'm, I'm starting to put things into those three buckets of the profession itself, the public we serve and the partners we do both those things with. Good work. Thank you for that. All right, Ms. Shelby. Um, I agree with a lot of the things that everybody has said, and I really put my um, these three, four buckets. So embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout all of the operations of the state bar. This is a repetitive one, so I apologize. Reducing the backlog and establishing um, shared metrics amenable to all stakeholders. Um, educate all licensees, stakeholders, and part partners and general public um, through ongoing and targeted communication about resources at the state bar. And then um, 
Uh, I love what Sean said about restoring because I think it's important to, 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 uh, to note that. And so restoring and building effective relationships with all constituencies, including legislative, regulatory, judiciary, um, and of course the general public. Okay. Um, let's go back to um, backlog. I've asked the same question of everyone and I have another question for you. Is that a function, as Mr. Stalling says, of reallocating resources? It may be a function of reallocating resources, but I don't think we, it may be a function of reallocating resources. It may be a function of additional resources, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to have to be effective with the resources we currently have. I, I don't know if we have the footing to be able to say we need more. Okay. Um, and this piece I meant to ask a couple of you this around educating licensees, is that, as someone else said, in the lane, if you will, of CLA, or is that is that something that this entity should do or should continue to do? When I think of um, when I think of supporting, when I look at our mission statement, and I think of supporting. Uh, particularly support of efforts for greater access to and inclusion. What comes to mind for me is pipeline, people who aren't there, representation, people who are already there, um, and then the composition of what kind of the diverse constituencies who we deal with that, that are there. All right. Dagger, um, did, we, did we move the um, LAP program over to CLA? I can't remember. No, we never got authority to do that. It's still with us. So we still have that, right? Mm -hmm. we, just, we just appointed somebody in our board meeting to LAP. Hope, hope it wasn't me. No, thank No, no, it wasn't, Mark. <laughs> but thank you for your support. No, no, that would have been a bad question if I just got appointed as liaison. No, Melanie means you just, we just appointed somebody to the oversight committee, not, not as a board liaison. So I have not, I'm sure everybody's relieved. I have not heard from Mr. Soul on goals. You're on mute, sir. Sorry. I've been sitting here listening and so much of uh, what I'm thinking is embedded in, in, uh, in what others have said that I really feel like, you know, um, I just don't want to be redundant. Okay. Okay. And so, um, but I'm going to press you to at least give me the two or three areas where you heard something that really resonated with you the most. That way I'll, I will have heard from you. Clearly. Um, the, uh, the issue about improving and sort of restoring relationships is, uh, is, is, is front and center for me. Um, the issue of uh, addressing um, uh, the disciplinary system in terms of the backlog uh, is, is also up there. And then finally, uh, the, the issue of uh, access to, uh, to justice in its various facets that folks have talked about is also uh, the three that I would uh, that I put up there. Okay, since you raised it, just and since you didn't talk as long as everybody else, um, what does access to justice mean to you? <laughs> um, I use and I, I purposely said in its many facets because I, I do I, heard believe, you. I do I do believe there is a uh, a DEI component to uh, uh, to all that. I, I believe it is. Uh, I was I've been uh, paying very close attention to to Brandon and. And to, to Mark Broughton's uh, sort of talk about um, uh, what's happening in sort of rural California as it relates mm -hmm. to, uh, to to access uh, to justice, as well as what Jose and others, um, uh, Hylin have have talked about in, in relationship to uh, uh, whether it's law schools uh, uh, or other um, sort of groups uh, that we would consider to be a, a part of our stakeholder community that, that can that can assist. Uh, us in terms of uh, education, outreach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
I appreciate that. So Leah, I'm gonna to come to you in a second. So be, be, be prepared. Thank you, Mr. Soule. I wanna circle back to um, Mr. Chairman who, who came out first, um, handle backlog, relationship with the legislature, more diversified profession is where you started. So I'm bringing it back around to ask, did you hear anything that changes your um, perspective, your order, um, or, or anything on your list? No, I don't think so. Um, okay. That's, that's a good conversation. Okay. Did anybody else hear anything or change, want to change their order priority or anything on their list or add something to your list? Okay, because I think we certainly heard some common themes. But Leah, you said you wanted to wait before kind of weighing in on some of what you've heard. And I want to give you a chance to offer some feedback as well. Sure. I just sent some um, to Dag uh, that you could cut and paste if you want it pop to your email really quick. But if it's too hard, I said strong relationships to advance our mission. You got them? Okay. Yeah. So this is kind of, um, as I was just listening to everybody, these are some of the ways I was thinking about it. Um, thinking about um, relationships <clears throat> um, an informed public and an empowered public, which to me, access to legal services would go under it. And I, I do believe that it's important for the state bar to clarify its role. And for me, that is legal services. Um, that's not just lawyers, but that's just my take. Uh, meaningful and effective prevention would be another kind of big category. Um, a robust and effective enforcement system, understanding that priority one is addressing the backlog and developing new case processing standards or metrics that have buy-in and credibility, and then a diverse and inclusive profession. So those are the buckets I thought of. Are you open to um, using the term public protection instead of enforcement in your buckets? Because I heard that a little. Sure, yeah, I, I'm not. This is just my immediate thoughts for the board's consideration. I don't, I don't feel wedded to any, to any of it. Um, I do have, you know, opinions that I'm happy to share. Yes, no, and I did, I raised that because I actually thought, um, I, I, I like that, that, um, posture, if you will, of public protection, you know, versus enforcement. Enforcement sounds, sounds more harsh. Okay. Um, so two things that I want to just do is ask a couple of you, um, in addition to maybe our chair, maybe Mr. Tony, um, and is Mr. Stalling still on? Yeah, I'm still here. There you are. I see you. I'm sorry. Um, as because you you are you make up the you've made up the been so helpful in the working group, um, Mr. Tony. Go ahead. But I was going to ask you both to give some feedback around just you know what I'm hearing as themes, but what what are you hearing as themes? But go ahead, Mr. Tony. Here we go. Uh, you, you know. Um, I want to give some reflections on um, the um, on, on what I've heard these last two days and a recommendation for how to move forward. Okay. Okay. So um, I am incredibly encouraged by what I've heard these last two days. I I am just incredibly encouraged, and I and I think because you know strategic planning is so important, and I think that. It's so important for any board involved in strategic planning to have a strong consensus, to reach a strong consensus. We, it, 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 we, we really don't want a, I think that we as a body 
would be far better served from a strategic plan that all of us enthusiastically embrace rather than a strategic plan that some of us really like and some of us are okay with and some of us are like, you know, I can, I, I can grit, grin and bear it. And I really think though, we're pretty close. That's what it feels like to me that I, I, I've heard just a lot of agreement. Um, I also feel that there are a lot of questions that were brought up that are not realistic for us to believe we can resolve in the remaining time today. Mm -hmm. That I would suggest that we probably need another full day of conversation um, to just go in a little deeper. Some of the, you know, particularly the questions uh, that uh, Trustee Broughton brought up about what does access to justice mean? Who, who the, the who and the what and the where <laughs> the location, you know, uh, 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 Trustee Stalin also brought up the location. So there are a lot of components. People have also brought up the, uh, you know, the, the uh, race equity issues, how to make sure that, that that's considered. So I, I, I think we're pointed in the same direction. I am just going to make a, um, uh, you know, just for myself, I am exhausted mentally after two full days. Maybe I'm the only one, but I am. And so I, 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 I'd like some consideration of, you know, thinking about wrapping up a little early today and really focusing on having a, a continuation of this discussion in March. I think it's more important to give ourselves the time to come to strong consensus than it is to try to wrap this up in, in a short period of time. That is my thought. Okay. And the other member of the working group, thank you, Mr. Tony, Mr. Stallings. Yes, I agree with, with Mark. I haven't heard anything uh, from any member um, that's you know particularly particularly divergent or, or different than uh, what I hear um, as a whole. So yeah, I, I too am encouraged. And the thing that keeps on popping up into my mind is, you know, if, uh, if a business, let's say there's a failure of operations, uh, there's no money, uh, they go into bankruptcy, they restructure. There's like this period where, um, you know, goes into receivership, um, the debts are forgiven, the slate is wiped clean. Certainly the state bar can't do that. And um, you know, can't go into receivership as it were. But I really feel like um, just in looking at the objectives of the last strategic plan from 2017 to 2022, that uh, I'm really encouraged in the, the broad uh, steps that we've made to try and reestablish that credibility to, not, not that our slate is wiped clean, but that we have I believe really answered the call that staff has really stepped up, that this board has really stepped up to make those tough decisions. And I think that in going forward into that next level of, of accountability of rebuilding trust, that we may have to make some other really tough decisions. And I think this board is well equipped to, with the stomach to do that and has the vision to ensure that the next steps going forward as we rebrand what the State Bar of California looks like, um, that we're going to um, that, that we're in a great, uh, great setting for that. So we have a lot of talent on this board, a lot of very um, connected and caring people. So I'm incredibly encouraged by this process. Um, one thing we would do if we were in the room together is I would also ask you to take a look at what is a, a pretty robust list and certainly have seen some themes. Um, I would ask you to pick one as Dag knows. And um, because it's one way to start to help to prioritize. And so I'm gonna uh, call on the two folks that have got their hands up, but I'm gonna come back and ask you all to do that as well. That will um, help me. And even if this 
um, conversation either as Mr. Tony proposes ends early or um, we wind up with a with another session, it still gives me a sense of where things are. So I'm gonna call on Ms. Chen and then Mr. Broughton and then ask everybody to pick one, so to speak. Go ahead, Ms. Chen. So I guess if I would pick one, it would have to do with our discipline system. And for me, it was getting to a place where we have an office of chief child counsel that is motivated, feels motivated and supported in achieving its goals of protecting the public. Um, you know, obviously getting through the backlog is part of that. Um, I did want to comment on one thing where mm -hmm. I feel like we're going to need definition, just as we need definition of what access to justice is. Um, I, th I totally agree with achieving, of striving towards the goal of making sure diversity, equity, and inclusion is part of everything the state bar does, not a silo department that is separate and apart, but that it is just intrinsic to everything that's done. I think we need to identify what the scope of that work is. Um, it's something that we ran into in the in the sort of reorganization process. Um, but you know my druthers would be to focus on the areas where the state bar has sort of jurisdiction and regulatory power and that sort of thing. So on law schools, for example, one thing we haven't talked a lot about, but that is you know a serious part of what the state bar does is um, you know, regulate via the bar exam, what the topics are on the bar exam, accreditation. Um, and so focusing on increasing diversity in law schools, they need help, they would love that help. And we also have to remember, we live in a state of, in California where some of the most significant law schools are public law schools and California has a Prop 209. And so achieving and maintaining diversity in our law schools and making sure that graduation rates stay high and certainly the positive mindset intervention, which Leah, I always forget what we're supposed to call it now, stories and- Strategies and stories. Okay, I got close. I got one of the words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was, it was an amazing development. And so more things like that, um, I think it's you know a laudable goal that, that one uh, promoted of getting more kids to go to law school, uh, more kids of color to go to law school. I am not sure that is something that the state bar should try to impact right now because we just don't have those resources. I mean, we can partner with organizations that do that work, but that's not an area that we directly oversee. So I think, I think understanding what we mean by increasing diversity and equity and inclusion means can help us figure out where to prioritize. And I thought one other person had their hand up, but they took it down. Yes, I did, because I had it up there, I think, by mistake. But I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree with, with Halen. Um, the protection of the uh, public through licensing regulation and uh, disciplining of attorneys has to be the number one priority. I like the idea also of defining further um, access. And so I mean, I've been saying that all along. And also um, what Halen says, I get the sense that we're now building upon what we did five years ago. We're, we're taking sort of what we did and now we're having to refine it. What does access mean? What does inclusion mean and so forth? Because these are all things that we did before. By the way, I will say this, this works a lot better when you're at the Sheraton uh, on Harbor Island in San Diego and you're all together. Yeah, I, Zoom is great, but yeah, being together is is wonderful. So who are you, um, Ellen? <laughs> yeah, so I throw that in. That, that's important. Um, <laughs> okay, so I've got two picks for discipline. Uh, Mr. Cincinnatus, pick one. Um, I guess my one. I'm going to go back to my categories, and I think we the reason we do everything we do is to support and protect the public. That's why we. That's why we help you know, administer and, and create a legal system. That's why we collaborate with our partners to, uh, you know, to make that a success and to educate and all that, but it's all to support the public. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dalen? In the same manner, protect the public. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stallings? Yep, I agree. Okay. 
there you go. You already took your meat button off. You knew I was looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with Highland. Discipline? Yeah. Mr. Tony. I think protecting the public because it's uh, a, a little bit broader than discipline. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sowell? I think I'll follow Mark's lead on that, but all these things are like 1A, 1B, 1C. They're, they're so close, you know what I mean? This part's meant to be hard, so I appreciate that. And usually when we're in the room, if we were at the, what was it, the Sheraton? Um, I'd give you one dot and then I'd let you know it's going to let you have another one, but it just forces you to, you know, kind of focus on what really what your real priority is. So I appreciate that, but I'm not giving you a 1A yet. Um, Ms. Shelby. Can you restate the question? If you had to take a look at the entire list of priorities we've all just discussed, yours or someone else's, pick one. Most Rel important. Relationship building. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. De La Cruz. Um, I would say public protection. I think uh, disciplining um, attorneys is part of public protection, so. Okay. Um, I missed one. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. You're really gonna force me to do one, huh? Um, I'm gonna say relationships. Okay. And I will just note for the record, Mark Broughton, that I tried really hard to get, <laughs> to get us in the desert or in San Diego or somewhere. That's how you can improve your performance now. There you, you go. Sure get us there. All right, I it's think not, I It's not how we can improve our relationships with our stakeholders, I can tell you that. <laughs> Going to a hotel in San Diego point, is not on well the taken. list. Point well taken. I do want Fair to enough. say, Cassandra, I think when we, people pick public protection, it's a little bit of an out um, because public protection includes lots of things. So I I'm, not, see it. I'm not sure it counts as one thing. But. I see it, but what I like that's happened, if I'm honest with you, is if we're, we're still in and around about three buckets and there is, you know, the, the point was to start to, as you asked, to get a little more consensus. I think for me, what's left to do now um, is to put some language around um, the buckets that, that sort of meet and match some of the language you all have used. We got ahead of you and, and used our language that we sort of pulled from what we heard in the early, early um, conversations. So that's one thing left to do. The other thing that's left to do, and again, I wanna be mindful of Mr. Tony's request, and I think Mr. the chair does as well, is to really be sure we define this question, these two questions, they, they are almost the same, but who is our public? And more to the point, what do we mean by access to justice? And I would argue, ask that question, what do we mean by access to judgment, uh, justice um, with the cards we've got right now? In other words, with the, cap with the capacity and the, 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 um, where we are able to and what, what uh, policy change might look like as well and, and then what we mean. So those are the two of the big things left for us to do. The other thing, as Leah knows that we wanted to spend some time on, and again, if we're gonna take on another session to do that, is just to have a, a little bit of a conversation around resources. So that's what's left undone from where I sit, Mr. Chair, but I do feel like I've got a sense going into that next conversation of where the, the priorities for this group um, sit. So this, this is, this part's been helpful to me and I hope it has been to all of you. Um, no, I think I'm, I'm there with you. Um, it makes it pretty obvious to me that we do uh, need another session, um, whether it's a couple hours or a four hour block. Um, I'll, you know, I'll put on the table. I think it's probably a three hour block at least. Um, 
there's been a lot of uh, work that each of the trustees and, and you guys have all put into today. So let me not forget to say again, thank you. Um, very encouraged, very energized, even though I sound tired. Um, I don't think it can wait until March. You know, I think that we should use February as uh, an opportunity to, to bridge ourselves to March. Um, and I see, I'm sorry, I see Leah's and Mark Broughton's hands up. Did you want to say something before we uh, get to this next scheduling part? Yeah, I just wanted to advocate for the Point Highland race because I also saw the tension um, between Juan's suggestion around going, you know, extending the pipeline back to encouraging people to go to law school and sort of certainly where our pipeline focus is now. And so I do think that um, that's sort of another definitional issue to add to the access question and who is our public question that will be important for the board to tackle. Thank you for that. Mark? Yeah, just very briefly, I do recall that when we um, did the, the last five-year strategic plan, it, we, we took more than one meeting to do that. There was the retreat, and then we met again at least one or two times, and I do recall the pages, the butcher paper up, and so forth and so on. So it took a while to get to that point. Um, the other thing is I, I just want to throw this out. We keep saying access to justice. The way it's defined in the in the statute in the mission statement is access to the legal system. So that kind of defines our mission. I don't know if it's different. I don't know if it's the same, but um, that's what it says in our statement. I just throw that out. Access to the legal system. So I mean that that also begs the question. Okay, the legal system is a pretty amorphous term itself, right? It could mean just the courts. It could mean you know knowing a lawyer or a paralegal or an, another professional who. Yeah, you know, has legal knowledge and can assist. I mean, there's, there's probably another definitional thing we need to do. Um, and your point, Mark, about uh, last time around, it, how it took a couple of full meetings, I think um, I had something I didn't know, so I appreciate that. Uh, let me suggest this. I know that uh, we're looking at a February meeting on, a, on approving a budget. Is that correct, Leah? Is, yes. that, already, is that already scheduled? I, Louisa, I don't know if you're on. I, I don't know if the date has been set yet for that meeting. Uh, not yet. No, I sent the poll, but we only have two responses so far. So a yeah. reminder, Louisa, I'd like you to resend the poll right after this meeting, which is going to end early. So maybe everybody yeah. can then answer the poll. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Pull out your calendars um, and, and let's get that, let's get that um, inked in. And then a general question to all of you, um, that, that sounds like between the budget and this next phase of the strategic planning, it would be a longer meeting, right? Um, four hours, perhaps? Am, am, I, am, am I misgaging that, Cassandra? I think that's about right. Four hours maybe for this discussion and then the budget. Which, and... would, be another, which would be another couple hours, Leah? Um, it doesn't need to be a couple of hours, but I will say that the reason that we postponed the discussion of the budget until February is we wanted to see if we needed to incorporate any changes into the draft based on the strategic planning discussions. We won't be able to do that now, and the budget statutorily is due February 28th. So um, the budget just may not exactly reflect the decisions that you make in strategic planning. That just will mean we'll need to do a budget amendment, but I just want to point that out. I don't, I don't think we need two hours for the budget. Okay. Probably, yeah. Uh, I, I see that our general counsel uh, put her hand and her camera on and up, and I think I, think I know why. Um, I think the question is if we are going to adjourn this meeting to a meeting in February, we need to know the date before we actually make that adjournment. Well, no? sort of, it's on that subject, you're correct. If the meeting, this is the BK guideline compliance, if the meeting is going to be allowed 10 days notice, you don't need to do invoke the adjournment provisions of Bagley Keen. You just put that I, this item on the, new, on the February uh, agenda. And it sounds like it will be. If you think the meeting will happen fewer than 10 days from today, then we have to pass a resolution for adjournment and have a date certain. So we'll, um, now, but not. I think it's likely you're going to have your 10 days notice, so we don't have to do that. No, it can't yeah. happen within 10 days because we need a finance committee meeting first. So, no. 
Well, and Cassandra, Cassandra and her team and probably uh, Mark and um, Brandon and I should meet once more before that as well. And that will also give all of us, the trustees, the time to think some more about these things. Hopefully we'll be able to send some some written follow-up materials to trigger further thought, further preparation, further research, uh, research, excuse me, further homework for that um, for that February meeting. So um, everybody good with that approach? You're gonna get a doodle poll, hopefully this afternoon from Louisa, fill it out. Um, and then we will get something on calendar uh, more than 10 days hence. And Ruben, I'm gonna ask Louisa to do it like for 10 to four or nine to three or something, just to give us enough time if we end early, that'll be great. Okay, I'm, I'm good okay. with that. Everyone good with that? Okay, looks like yes. Anybody, anything we need to take care of um, with staff? Public comment, Vanessa, do we need to take public comment? I think that's up to you. What What did you just say, Ruben? Whether we needed to take public comment. I see a, I see a hand raised in the attendee list. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and entertain that public comment. We'll give whoever it is uh, three minutes to address the board. Um, they did hang in with us until the very, the very bitter end after all. Um, so if you could, I'm not sure how we do this. Is Do they need to be, there you are. Um, Hadsel Stormer, Rennick, Die. Please, uh, please share your thoughts. You've got three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is David Washington. I'm an attorney at uh, Hadsel Stormer, Rennick and Dye. We're based out of LA in Pasadena. Uh, I first, I just want to say thank you to everyone for you know, the work you're doing on, on all of this. I think it's really important. Um, I, I, there's one concern that I think we had, which is um, involving people and the uh, attorneys in the, in the strategic planning process. It was pretty difficult for us to find out about this meeting in the first place. And, um, and you know, we reached out to places like UCLA, the National Lawyers Guild, uh, CELA, which is the um, Employment Lawyers Association here in LA, uh, LACBA, Labor and Employment uh, Council on American Islamic Relations, um, Muslim Bar Association of SoCal, um, ACLU, and none of these organizations were aware of the survey or of this meeting. Uh, none of the people we talked to at them were, and you know, I, I obviously, I, I, I was here for most of the meeting today. I didn't hear it was discussed in closed session, obviously, but um, I didn't hear any any discussion at all of the surveys. I don't know how many of them were filled out. I know a number of us here at Hatzel Stormer filled them out. Um, but I, I think, especially when it comes to uh, questions of diversity and inclusion, getting um, the input of people and ha hearing what, what, you know, what's going on on the ground um, is important. And so I think I would just in encourage you all uh, for this upcoming session and future sessions to uh, do some outreach in terms of uh, letting people know that this is happening and, um, and seeking feedback from people. Um, yeah, that's just a concern that I had that I wanted to share. Thank you for that input. It's, um, it's, it's taken uh, seriously and, and then appreciated as is your attendance. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the board's indulgence for just a few minutes because I see that uh, Andrew Tuft is also listed as an attendee. Um, folks probably recognize Andrew's name as uh, a very talented ethicist and lawyer who has assisted uh, some of our work over the over the years. Uh, works in the Office of General Counsel. Um, Andrew has recently announced his departure and pending departure from the bar to pursue another opportunity. Um, and so Andrew, I don't know whether you are comfortable coming on and, and uh, letting us uh, see your face so we could say thank you and wish you Godspeed and well in your next uh, endeavor. But I certainly wanted to tell you that I appreciate all the good work that you've done since, uh, since I've known you on the board, so. I'll open it up if anybody wants to say anything. There he is. 
Uh, I'm not camera ready, but uh, I appreciate that so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I know you guys have been uh, busy at work. I did not need to take uh, any of your time, but I do just want to acknowledge um, you taking the time of acknowledging me, which was very kind and sweet, and I appreciate that. Um, I know it's been a long day for you all, so I won't take any more time. I was just listening as a uh, interested member of the public, um, concerned uh, person of the profession, and a loyal former employee of the state bar. So thank you. Oh. Thank you, Andrew. I, I got the timing wrong. I apologize. I wasn't sure when the departure was, but it must have happened very recently. So again, um, good luck to you and thank you for all your work. Okay, trustees, staff, everyone, thank you so much for a solid two days. Melanie, you did it with COVID. That's probably got to be a first in the history of the state bar. Um, so you'll go down in the annals. All right. That's it. We're adjourned. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, I'll see Melanie. Bye, everyone.